Hello, and welcome to the Thursday, November 2nd um, regular meeting of the Hopkinton School Committee. Sorry, I have the wrong agenda on the top of my packet. Um, I will ask you to stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Well, we actually have a full house tonight, which is very unusual for us, so that is a great thing. I will read through our agenda. We're going to shuffle a few things to uh, add a little bit of efficiency to the process of our meeting tonight. Um, so first... As always, we will have recognitions, followed by our first um, opportunity for public comment. Following public comment, we will have reports to the school committee. We have a student council report. We have liaison reports from school committee members. Uh, the assistant superintendent is going to give us our MCAS performance report. I will have uh, the school committee chair report, and then Dr. McLeod will give the superintendent's report. Under new business, we will be reviewing again our FY19 capital improvement plan and taking a vote on that for submission to the town manager. Um, we will have our first reading of school committee policy EEA transportation. We will have our first reading of school committee procedure EEA-1 bus safety and our first reading of school committee policy KCD gifts to the schools. Um, under old business, we'll, ha we'll continue our conversation about school committee policy EBC, safety and security, and we will have an update about the superintendent search screening committee. Following that, we'll have our second opportunity for public comment and items by consensus, and it is our goal to adjourn by 9.55, which might be optimistic. Um, so... I do want to shuffle things a little bit just to accommodate people who are here. So I don't think we have recognitions tonight. We do not have recognitions tonight. So normally we start with public comment. I'm going to ask your, um, I'm going to ask leave to let our student council just give their report briefly. It usually takes about five minutes because I know they have homework and probably college applications to take care of. So why don't we do that first? So Bridget and Zach, if you want to come on up and tell us why we couldn't park when we got here tonight. <laughs> that would be good. Hello. Hello. I'm Zach. I'm Bridget. Um, so there's a lot going on at the high school tonight. We have the um, class of 2020 is doing their talent show tonight. Um, so that brought a big crowd when I walked by. And also the volleyball team just won their first playoff game tonight. So, um, so it's a fun time for, speaking of athletics, it's, it's a fun time for Hiller Athletics. Um, four of our fall sports teams um, are currently in the tournament. Um, volleyball just won. Girls field hockey won earlier today. Um, so awesome. they'll play again Saturday. Girls soccer will play their first game at home on Monday. And boys football, who won last week in their first playoff game against Pembroke, will host Dartmouth here tomorrow night at 7. Wow. Nice. Awesome. Wow. Um, so some things that we that have been going on in our school is uh, we had we took a stress survey today that was sent out by the administration, so those results will be coming soon. Um, next Thursday during advisory, we have our first Alice safety drill. Um, we had Senior Halloween on Tuesday, which was a, su a success, and it was a lot of fun. And also for seniors, um, November 1st was most early action college deadline, so there's been a lot going on for us. Talk about stress, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> wow. Um, and lastly, Student Council is doing a shoe drive next week at the high school. Um, there's a contest with a local radio station, 103 amp radio um, and they're doing a shoe drive where they're donating all the shoes to the boys and girls club and the winner of the shoe drive whichever school collects the most bags of shoes gets a concert from Liam Payne who's a popular uh, artist um, so that's kind of our incentive here cool. that we're trying to advertise so hopefully if we get a lot of donors we can um, win the concert <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Are they new shoes or gently used? Or? Yeah, so gently used, reusable um, boots, sneakers, any kind of shoe. So I think that's it. Yeah. Very good. Great. So who won the costume 
contest? Um, or who the, were your favorites? The um, so the Madden covers won the uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Yeah. That was awesome. That was a great contest. And there was a lot of uh, other winners. Social Butterflies was one that won. Oh, cute. They all dressed up as a different social media app, and they were like butterflies. Oh, cool. Oh, cute. Um, and there was a... Slenderman Yeah, twice. Slenderman won Scariest. He was on stilts. He was like eight feet tall. I saw that. Yeah. He was really on stilts? Yeah. Wow. Um, so that was really scary. And then another group was a dance, a disco dance. Oh, yeah. And one person was the disco ball, so that was oh, funny and unique. Yeah. Cute. And that video is on HCAM already. Yep. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. Anybody have any questions? Great. All right. Well, I'm sure you already got your applications in yesterday, <laughs> but uh, you probably have some homework. So thank you so much, as always, for being here. You're more than welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting, but you do not have to. All right. Thank well, you. Thank, thank, thank you so much. Thank okay. Thanks, guys. <laughs> you already know them. Yeah. So, Okay, so thank you for that indulgence. So now let's go back to our regular public comment section. And um, I know some people walked in after I gave my little spiel. So our public co comment policy is floating around out there, but typically, especially with a crowd like this, um, we are not going to go back and forth with you. We have gotten emails from a lot of you. We all have copies. We have all read them. Um, but you're more than welcome to come up and, you know, add to that. Or if you haven't emailed us, come in and share your feedback with us. Following that, we will have a discussion of the policy that you're all concerned about. We'll move that forward so you can hear that. You don't have to sit here for the rest of the night. Um, but we will keep you to the three minutes just because we have a packed agenda and a lot of people to hear from. So when you come up, the microphone again is for HCAM so that it, you can hear it on the broadcast. So people back there are not hearing you better because of that microphone. So just please speak loudly, introduce yourself, let us know, you know your name and address, and then you can, um, you can share your thoughts with us. So whoever would like to break the ice and go first, please come on up. Or if no one has any, <laughs> he just came out for no reason. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. And I will keep the time. Okay, yeah, I deputize Nancy over here to keep the time. Okay, thank you very much. So. I'm Andrew Kessler, uh, 12 Ledstone Drive. Um, all I can say is I'm in the child care field. I have after school programs, not to compete with Hopkinton. We're the only town that doesn't require people to stay on the same bus, but it's a nightmare. I have parents who fill my parking lot on the days their kids don't come, waiting to pick their kids up because they're stuck to one bus. i sure it's a nightmare for the public schools, but you have to think about all the parents who are out of convenience, need to have a variety of options. I don't think it's unfair to ask us to pay an additional fee. The alternative is to ask Kids Bro, TLC, everyone else to buy their own bus. But I've seen the buses at Center School around the corner. I've also seen the pickup line. If you're asking parents now, so my own children who go three days a week to after school, if I have to go and stand in line at Center School two more days, that line is already around the corner. Mm -hmm. And you're going to just compound that and compound that and compound that. So I, I'm sure it's a nightmare. And maybe additional fees to pay for a bus monitor or someone to sort the kids is the answer for our, us families that don't need full-time care. But to ask us to pick one bus, you're going to either cause chaos around the schools that pick up, or you're going to cause chaos at the after-school locations, because then all the parents have to, who aren't even going to kids, bro, still have to park in the parking lot and pick their kids up on mm -hmm. the bus. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Anybody else? It wasn't that hard. Good evening, school committee, uh, administration. I uh, just want to give a couple thoughts, opinions. Uh, Hopkinson's always been a great town to live in. Uh, Sorry, can you just give us your name? Sure, first? Steve Moody. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, it's a very proactive town. I thought it was great that we had the opportunity to pick fixed days where our kids would be able to go to daycare. Um, myself, my wife, we both work different schedules. We work 12 hours on, a day off, eight hours on. Uh, so it allows us to be with our kids when we need to be home with them, get them off at the bus certain days of the week without having to have daycare every single day. By having a fixed bus schedule where the kids are, you know, have to go to one location every day, 
Uh, you know, when my wife is off on certain days of the week, now she has to go to a daycare center to pick up her, pick up our kids and then bring them back home. So it, it, it would create an inconvenience for families. Um, you know, I, I think the administration, they've done a great job with how they've managed it in the past. Um, and maybe it just needs another look where maybe it's software enabled or maybe there's a different scheduling system or a different way to make it easy for the administration at the school to, you know, track the students with what buses they're getting on and what days, because I'm sure that's no easy task. Um, and just to look at other options besides going backwards and saying, hey, we need to make this really simple, stupid, you get to do one thing every day. You know, in this day and age, parents are working different days, working different schedules. Um, people have hybrid jobs where they work from home some days and work in the office. People don't have nine to five jobs today anymore. It's different. So take it into consideration and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Rajiv Chimalakonda, and uh, we kind of moved here last year. Uh, our son goes to kindergarten. And uh, I travel into Boston every day, uh, so Monday to Thursday. And I try to work uh, from home on Friday. So it's pretty a challenge for us to kind of coordinate if we have to send our, you know, coordinate in such a way that right now he goes to daycare. Uh, it'll be very difficult for us to kind of, you know, have that same schedule going if one of us has to pick up or if we have to alter our schedule to kind of pick him up from either a Kittsboro or from another daycare center. So it's, it's challenging. I mean, uh, sometimes I get to work from home. I can adjust my schedule. It becomes all right. But on other days, it's just not possible for, you know, somebody coming rushing back from Boston and if it train delays and stuff like that, that can cause us impact. I mean, that definitely impacts us as parents. If I, if I was told that, hey, your son's only going to do, you know, five days on the same route, it becomes challenging for us. I mean, to rush back and if, the tra if there's train delays and winter's coming up, it just becomes a nightmare to kind of coordinate everything. So if there's an opportunity to kind of go across, where right now we have him on three days or four days, it just helps us because one day that I can pick him up at home it just is very easy for us. So just so that you guys consider, I mean, I understand you guys are looking at it from a busing schedule perspective. Yes, there is, there is challenges. But there should be some opportunity to digitize this. I mean, I'm sure the school board's looking into it. But something to make it a little more easier as we move forward. I mean, the digital age is coming. We're using different tools uh, from cloud and you know apps and stuff like that. But if there's some opportunity to do that to help the school also to kind of coordinate that, that'll be awesome. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Sudhir Bonala. I've been in town for almost seven years, and I pretty much echo whatever Steve Moody said. The other aspect I want to add is my daughter goes to different activities. So she has gymnastics, which is a different time, and then she has piano classes at HCA, which is at a different time. So if you force us to pick one schedule, so that means we have to give up all these enrichment activities. Say, just go to daycare, you know, play with your friends, and come home or now we'll have to run around for five days a week to figure it out because now we have no choice but to find five different activities or there's no point going to five piano classes a week. So we'll have to come up with five different activities to keep her occupied or send her to the same daycare five days a week. So from that aspect, scheduling, understand the challenges, but also we're taking away opportunities to learn new things. So that's one thing I want to add. Thank, Thank you, you very time. much. Thank you. I am Brad Varekia from 292 Hayden Row. Um, I'm just coming up to speed on these changes, the proposed changes, so I, hopefully the committee will talk a little bit about why they're making them, if they're logistic, prim primarily logistic-based or monetary-based. But as everybody before me has said, the flexibility and convenience this day between one parent, two parents, parents and a grandparent, um, da daycare is paramount to getting things done and, and having life being somewhat efficient, especially with multiple activities like the last gentleman said. So why things are happening is very, very important because if you can fix part of it, if it's monetary, add an extra fee. If it's logistics, have, have a better system, hire somebody, or you know, better technology, whatever it is. But to the first cut at taking away flexibility from the parents and the daycare providers, 
hopefully isn't the first option. This should be the absolute last option, in my opinion. So hopefully the committee will talk a little bit about why mm -hmm. when, when you get to your commentary. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Glenn Thompson. Um, I've got <clears throat> a seven-year-old at uh, Elmwood. I have a five-year-old who's a kindergartner at, um, at Center School, and I've got one that's coming up and will be in the school system in two years. So I bring a little bit potentially a different si uh, situation than, than folks that only have one kid. But <clears throat> my wife is a nurse at Children's Hospital. I work three days a week. I work full-time. And <clears throat> we need to have that flexibility to be able to send them to daycare and not only is it a financial impact if we have to send the same the kids to the same place all five days uh, a week but also from a, a social perspective we've made really good friends with uh, folks at our bus stop it's tied us to the community um, not only socially for us but socially for the kids as well so they've made friends at their bus stop in addition to having friends at uh, at Kidsboro or whatever after school program. So that's, I think, an important thing from a community perspective, the financial situation um, also. And uh, I'd reiterate just the, the busing as far as the, the chaos of having to have all the parents there. They don't have the, the parking spots for everybody to come and pick up their kid every day. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully they'll reconsider and think about, you know, um, kind of a more modern lifestyle of, of people who have flexible schedule some days I'll work from home sometimes I'll be, I'll be traveling some days I'll have to send them for an extra day um, to Kidsboro so it's always changing always evolving and there's no two days that are the same so thank you very much thank you, thank you. did anybody else want to come up hello my name is Matt Karras and uh, I have two boys one is in the school system now is in kindergarten and the next will be joining him in a couple of years so um, you know I just kind of obviously echo a lot of the thoughts that everybody else had but you know my wife and I personally each work about an hour away from home so the flexibility the current system allows is you know to us very it's a great benefit it's wonderful it allows us to be able to you know coordinate things with each other a lot easier on a week-to-week -week basis um, you know in addition to obviously the the, the pain points of trying to figure out the same schedule every day that everybody else, you know, has kind of mentioned. I think it also presents logistical challenges and just, just in terms of making that happen. We can't get home in time for bus pickup every day, so that forces us to, to, to find a five-day-a-week schedule for, for, for an after-school program or, or something. And the number of, t and I haven't done an extensive amount of research on this, but I think if everybody is put in that same position, the number of resources available for that are, are finite. They're limited in town. You know, as it is, I already have to juggle with our daycare providers. If we need an, uh, an extra day that my son gets dropped off for, for something, you know, they have to work around what their constraints are, how many children they have in their facility. So I think placing other parents and all kind of grouping them in that position, in addition to traffic and, and all those other things, it's going to be difficult for the existing programs in place to take in potentially all those children. So I, I think, you know, you know, there's obviously the cost and all that too, but I, I just think it's going to be problematic on the other end, you know, um, not only for us, but the providers that could maybe take the children in, in the after school programs to accommodate everybody. So that's all I had to say. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I'm Liz Meehan. I have two sons at Elmwood School in third grade. They're twins, Thomas and Patrick. Um, I echo everything that every other parent said, I'm representing working moms. Um, my The boys go to Kidsboro. And when I first, um, when they were first in kindergarten, I was so delighted to find out about the busing uh, situation and the flexibility that we would have with them going because we knew they couldn't go five days a week. It wasn't something that our family could do. And I, I was just so grateful. I thought this is one of the reasons we moved to Hopkinton in the first place, the great schools, the flexibility. Um, I cherish those two days a week. I actually chose Wednesday and Friday because those are all the half days. And it is 
just integral to me being able to, I have packed in a, um, a full-time job into about six and a half hours a day. And being able to have one late day, two late days a week where I can take late calls on the West Coast where the boys absolutely love going there. Um, it's a great environment. They've made a lot of great friends. I'm just, I've been so grateful for it. So like what Andy said in the beginning, um, you know, can we consider an extra fee? I believe that when we first signed up, we did pay a fee of I think $150 a kid um, for the bus, which I was gladly willing to pay for the flexibility of having that childcare. Um, and the only other thing, I just, when you're talking later, I'd like to know, are all after school programs being impacted by this policy or is it just some? Because I, I've heard that actually the school-based um, programs are not being impacted, which I think is an interesting thing for everyone to consider and talk about. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, going once, going twice. Okay. Um, well, thank you all for for uh, for first of all for your sharing your experiences and your feedback, but also for really um, being so respectful about our time. We really do appreciate that. So I would like to ask the indulgence of the committee to move new business item B forward, and we'll discuss that now. And then we'll later go back to reports and um, start with your report, Dr. Kavanaugh, after that for the MCAS. Okay. But in doing that, I think we do have our elementary principals here. Sh can we invite them? Would you like to join us up here? So I feel like you should – I don't want to put you on the spot, but um, you are That's the ones – That's why they're here. You are the ones <coughs> who are seeing the other side of the equation, and I think it's important uh, – we need to know um, what the impact is on you, but in addition, people are, are really wanting to understand why it is that you feel like we need to make a change um, to our best it? policy. So yes, of course. So we always start with Dr. McLeod to introduce the, Thank you. the issue. So go ahead. Thank you. Just so you don't have to. <laughs> um, so thank you, everybody, and, and to those of you who wrote to the school committee, we did read all of your um, letters, and, and it's exactly why we review policy in the way that we do. Right, because we want to understand how it impacts all the people that live in the town. Um, the, I, I kind of will summarize what I heard and what I've read into three categories. There was an additional question that came up tonight. I don't know if we'll get to everything tonight. Um, but, uh, of course, thank you for all being here. It's really wonderful of you to be here. Um, so three general themes that are arising from the feedback, um, as I've heard it, are the scheduling issue, is this being generated because of scheduling and are there ways of making scheduling more efficient, easier, um, using different software? That was That's a theme that I've been hearing in the feedback. Um, flexibility being really valued, uh, valued by the community, the flexibility that is provided by our current services um, is something that people have come to count on. Um, and to take it away without any, without deep consideration would, would not be something that we'd be wanting to do, of course. Um, the cost, I heard as a, a third theme, which is, is this, if this is driven by cost, um, let's consider some ways of making up the, ch the difference between the, the cost incurred um, for those who are affected. Um, and then the, the final question that I heard was around just more understanding around how this affects all programs within the schools. So some general um, misunderstandings as well. Um, in addition to those themes that came out of tonight's discussion, and of course I'm sure you've heard others, uh, there, there were some discussions that I had from, with people where there was just some general misunderstandings around what's intended in the policy. And I know as we read through it and as we work through it, the reason, one of the reasons we take up policy is to clarify the language and to clarify misunderstandings. So um, as Jean, as you've pointed out, this is the beginning of a conversation. We would, um, it's never your practice to, to vote on a policy on the first reading, particularly one that has as much public um, effect on the public as this one would. But I wonder uh, for any of you, and not to put any of you on the spot, if any of the comments tonight um, or any of the issues that I've shared with you in meetings that we've had this week for other reasons, particularly around the budget, um, if, if something that came to me as we were discussing was that you know better than anybody, and the word I'm, it's never chaos, 
but one of the questions that has come to me from the school committee is, you know, how many how many times is, does, does it really occur that there is a child that's placed on the wrong bus or that a child is, um, you know, st stays at school when they're supposed to go home? And, and I said, well, I, I think that's the wrong question. It rarely happens. And the reason it rarely happens is because of the amount of work that it places on the schools to ensure that the numbers of children get safely where they need to go on an ever-changing schedule. Every single day is different. Um, so maybe begin there, and then if you have anything else that you'd like to add to help the school committee's understanding, that would be fabulous. And also, we all know you, but can you introduce yourselves? Because probably oh, everybody yeah. hasn't had the pleasure sure. of being in your buildings yet. So, Lauren, why don't you start? I'm Lauren DeVille, the principal of the Center School and Preschool. Um, so I, I can understand everything the parents said, and I just want to add another side. We hear from parents who are at home, and um, the bus schedule changes when children aren't on the bus because they go to daycare. Because while their child might take a bus to and from their home location, in terms of when children are on the bus to go to daycare, sometimes there's a large volume on different days, it impacts their route. So there's frustration on that end because they're missing the bus. The bus is, you know, the route isn't accurate because while they have the approximate times, children are often not on that bus and that's hard um, because we can't, you know, control yep. which days children ride the bus and not ride the bus because they have two seats, if you yes, know, yes. Um, on their buses. So in terms of children getting to the right location, that is something we continually strive to improve and it is a very small percentage because it is organized and as you said, organized chaos, if you will. It is. We have 26 buses. We've got a lot of little kids. And just on a typical day, today we have 37 changes over the course of the day. So in addition to the office completing its regular tasks, if you will, in terms of all of those requirements, those changes don't come in all at once. It's an email. It's a note. It's, it's a change. It's an emergency late in the day. There's a lot of emergencies in town, I would say. Um, so managing those and ensuring children get to the correct location, that adds to it. Um, when we have days that we have an early release and, or a day off such as a holiday, making sure we've got that right schedule. Today is Tuesday. It's not Monday um, because we are so adamant and mindful of where our children go. So if we can make it as smooth as possible, that's our goal, and to get everyone where they can when they should be. So thinking of the daycare parent side as well as the parents that don't have daycare yeah. and are waiting for that bus. and and often may miss it. Thanks, um, Lauren. Sorry, I'm Ann Carver, the principal at Elmwood School. And I guess the word that stuck out for me the most was the idea of flexibility. And as a parent, I, I, I completely understand the need for flexibility in a schedule. But what I think is hard to, to paint a picture of is what that flexibility brings to an office. And we're not a big corporation. We're just, a, you know, I, I speak for Elmwood School when I say there's two really wonderful ladies who sit in the office and handle dismissal. And on, on an average day, I believe that Elmwood School has at least 50 changes to a typical day. And on that, and on, so that's average 50, but some days, like last Wednesday, I think we had 77 changes to the typical dismissal. On an early release day, folks might decide I'm not going to do what I would typically do. Um, because it's an early release day, we might have up to 100 changes in how a child goes home um, typically. And what happens is, I, I think most folks probably spend time in their homes talking about, okay, and today is Tuesday, today's your daycare day, and kind of walking through the routines with their children and the kids likely seem very ready to, to do the thing that they're expected to do. But fast forward six and a half hours and they're in their classroom and they're not really attending to their, their afternoon routines and they sometimes forget. So if they're on autopilot, maybe they get on their home bus, but today actually was a daycare day. Um, and so they don't get misplaced because of the, the, the routines that we follow as a school, checklists for kids and taking attendance at different spots throughout the dismissal process. So kids don't get lost, but the, the time and stress that, that 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 causes our office and and it's challenging where we're all walk, using walkie-talkies to communicate 
does, can someone see Lauren DeBow? Where is Lauren? <laughs> Lauren is supposed to be on the bus today and she's not on bus 12. And someone will say, oops, Lauren forgot and went to pick up because she thought today was a pickup day. So it's certainly not our intention to take um, flexibility away from folks, but we really want to be mindful of how challenging it is to create safe dismissal processes for students. So maybe there's um, something we can do that, that keeps both in mind. Thanks, Ann. Hi, I'm Vanessa Bellello. I'm the principal at the Hopkins School. Obviously, by my point in time in a student's career, they're a little more able to manage these transitions on their own. And so we have less challenges as far as making sure students know what they're supposed to do for the normal routines. And so many of our students do understand where they go on one day or the other. So I didn't focus as much on how many of our students have split transportation set up within power school, which is a large number of the students in the school. And for the most part, um, like Lauren and Ann shared, the students at my grade level do it on their own, but also um, you know, we utilize our staff for that last 30 minutes of the school day we have not just our two staff in the office, but it's also our entire paraprofessional crew making sure that we're ready for parent pickups, we're ready for the buses, and um, ready for the students to go to all of the directions they go to. I would agree that um, early release days are you know, especially challenging. I focused on the number of unexpected changes within a day in our building. So these are a beyond what is listed in power school changes. Yeah. On a Monday through Thursday, it's um, between 25 and 50 parent call-ins or emails for changes. On a Friday, we look at typically 50 changes in a single day, and on early releases, it's well over 100. Um, and that's beyond what is listed in power school as a student's schedule, even if that's a split schedule. And so that, and that also doesn't um, involve some of the after school programming that occurs at school and students forgetting those kind of changes. So parents send in notes about those activities. Um, clearly when you're talking about the, those numbers of changes that occur within the day, and as Lauren alluded to, we, we have within our elementary handbook a time frame when we say this is the end time. And I would say that every single day there are a good five to ten that come in right after that, and we are scrambling to make sure that that child knows where they're going on that day. That is where the biggest fear of us missing right, something right, with right. a student is. Um, so, you know, the, the requests beyond even what is in our handbook as far as policy on when we will accept changes um, occurs on a daily Seems basis. Right. Mm -hmm. Seems right. Thank you. Sure. Okay. And um, so also, for those of you who don't know, uh, Susan Rothermick is our director of um, finance and operations and is in charge of busing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably best part of her job. But I, I also want to make sure that you have the chance to, to weigh in um, about. And, and Susan also has just come here this summer. So she has, has experience in a lot of other districts and has seen this from a lot of different um, angles. So anyway, if okay. you can provide a little context as well, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, so this, re this really began uh, looking at the number of students that have, that hold two seats on a bus. Um, so that, that's the beginning. So we have over 200 kids um, that hold two seats on a bus. So that is, you know, obviously with 60 kids on a bus, that's three additional buses that we're running because we're holding two seats for those children. A um, couple of other pieces that I heard was in terms of a fee. So in grades uh, 6 through 12, we do uh, 7 through 12, we do still charge a fee. That's $155. That's, that's your current bus fee. Um, it is correct that within uh, the younger grades, within the two mile, you could also charge that fee. But keep in mind, at $155 bus fee, 60 kids, that's $9,300. It's $60,000 for a bus. So in terms of looking at an additional fee, $9,300 is what you're collecting now for a $60,000 bus. Um, so even adding an additional fee, it, that just gives you in terms of the, the context for that. 
Um, the other piece that I heard mentioned was the um, potential of this not affecting our in-house daycare. So the piece with that is when you have an organization within the school district, so we do have an in-house daycare, that responsibility of making sure they have their children is now pushed to that organization. So right now the responsibility falls within the schools, but you have an outside provider within the school providing daycare, that responsibility now falls to them. So they know that Johnny is supposed to be here Monday, Wednesday, Friday. They will make sure that they have their children before the buses roll. So it pushes that whole chaos that they're doing. That management now goes to the in-house daycare. A um, couple of other points, too, that I had um, brought up before is we did talk to area towns um, to see what other districts were doing. And the other districts that do require this same uh, consistency, so um, one, one stop five days a week, Again, I, and I mentioned this at the last time, is Uxbridge, Douglas, Newburyport, Carlisle, Milford, Southboro, Northboro, Bellingham, Northbridge, Medway, and Westwood. And the interesting piece with Westwood is they will only transport to and from home because they run an in-house daycare. Hmm. So that was an additional caveat at Westwood. Sue, so there was some other information I think you shared with me about daycares providing transportation, separate transportation? So there, there are daycares. I don't have the statistics on that, but sometimes daycares um, then, you know, similar to having an in-house transportation that is responsible for making sure they have their children, a daycare then could provide transportation to the school, pick up the children. It would be that same um, pushing that responsibility. So again, they would be responsible to make sure they had all their kids, you know, say like a kids borough, they sent their own bus. They got their, their kids. They know who's in attendance. Again, it takes the responsibility out from the school, and then, you know, that particular daycare has their children. And to clarify, because I think it's worthy of clarification in both of those situations that you just listed, which is the in-house daycare or a daycare provider outside of the schools that provide that came in and provided transportation, how does that affect the five day a week rule? So if you had, um, in, in those instances, you could declare your home as being your five day home. Mm -hmm. But then Kidsboro would know as a for instance, or the in-house daycare would know that Tuesday, Wednesday, they come to my daycare. On the other days, you don't have to send that note they because home. their home bus is their home bus. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't take away the flexibility. That exactly. is not suggesting to take away the flexibility in either of those scenarios. The flexibility would remain that parents could choose two days or three days or one day mm -hmm. of a daycare situation and their, their seat would be back and forth to home. Correct. Right. Just wanted to clarify what that would mean. Just more information for you as you're... Okay. thinking about this policy. And how would the transportation occur from the school to Kidsborough? They would have a van, I think Kids is Borough what you're saying. So I, That's just a suggestion. I okay. So I think what would be helpful, you guys tell me, but I think for the purposes of tonight, I think it would be helpful for us to at least um, identify, there are a lot of dominoes in this, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that, that knock each other down. There are a lot of different points that we need to consider that range from the first and foremost safety of our students and getting them. It is our responsibility to safely transport them to and from school. Um, to and from home. To and from home. Mm -hmm. To school from Correct. Thank you. Um, but we also have financial considerations. We have, you know, the considerations and concerns that our parents have regarding flexibility. I just as a disclaimer, all of us are or have been working parents. You know, I, I know I might have a little more gray hair than you, but <laughs> but we understand technology and all of that. So um, so please don't think that, you know, I, I've been seeing comments that the school committee isn't concerned about working families. Nothing could be further from the truth. We're bringing this forward early in the year so that if a change is made, people will have plenty of time to make changes to their schedules, and this isn't something that you're going to have a week to react to because obviously that doesn't add to the safety of the kids. But we also need to be concerned about the time on learning that we're required to provide um, and just the, you know, the educational 
the teachers need to be teaching, not shuffling bus notes. So we need to sort of balance all of those things. So I think what would be helpful um, for tonight is if we could get a little bit of what's on your mind in terms of questions, what is more information that you need that you'd like to have um, so that we can spend the next two weeks working on that and have um, a follow-on conversation with, with greater information and greater detail. So um, why don't I start? Usually I don't call you out, but why don't we just start and we'll go around this way and then I'll um, we'll, we'll keep notes and I'll fill in at the end just what we think all of our considerations are that we really need to get more information about and we'll go on from there. Okay? Okay. Okay. So as, as everyone's been speaking, I'm not texting or anything. I'm taking notes. <laughs> um, and to me, it kind of, I feel like, to use a football analogy, we've got a call already on the field here, and it's under review, and I'm wondering if we have enough evidence to overturn what we already have as the call. So safety, yes, is, is critical. Um, obviously, cost always is a factor. Um, so I guess as we continue this conversation, those are the two pieces that I really, I mean, I feel like, yes, daycare providers could pick up at the schools that would solve that problem of, of us having to bust the kids and, and the, the fees that, that our district needs to pay. I don't know that that would solve the administrative chaos of the, of the dismissal. I think that wouldn't necessarily change the burden. It would sort of be a net zero instead of getting them to the... I think the only thing that, that might influence is that as Susan already suggested, when the Kidsboro van, for example, and I'm, I'm not picking on Kidsboro for any reason. It's, it's just the only one that I know of um, <laughs> outside of the why that comes to Elmwood. So if a van were to come to the school and they and we had a process where they picked up and they, you know, they have a roster of students they're expecting and they would say, well, we're Sand Carver, this is Tuesday, uh, we would immediately know that there was something not right. So it wouldn't necessarily change all the notes, but it would be a more immediate, if a child does get on a bus that they, they often get on, then the driver is not going to say, today's not your day. So they wouldn't necessarily notice until they get to the home and there's not a parent there to receive the child. Then they call the office and say, I'm at Ann's house, there are no parents there, um, what should we do? And then we start kind of a, oh, that child wasn't supposed to go to the home bus, that child and then sometimes the drivers will say, well, I'll swing by and drop them off at mm -hmm. Kidsboro because I'm going by. So we make accommodations because of this confusion. And I'm want, I wonder if we had a separate bus that was going straight to that provider or to karate. Or I've worked in communities where every provider has their own means of transportation and it's labeled. Right. And then that sort of helps with some of that end of the day confusion. Okay. But and the other I, thing that I do think about is that when we do make all these changes at the end of the day, there is time on learning loss as secretaries are calling into the classrooms, does the child have a note? Today's a day, you know, <coughs> and the kids are have to come down and get their note and there's a, probably a 15 minute window at the end of every day where there's a lot of questions and answers. Okay. And yeah, and so that's I guess where trying to figure out the balance between those two things because I'm definitely I mean I see both sides very clearly on this issue and the need to um, streamline things de-stress the staff find a less expensive option um, and and sort of align ourselves with something that makes sense yes I get that but I also think as a lot of folks have have said tonight we are a community who's highly educated we have you know, we are not a nine to five community. And so I think to serve the folks who live in our town who are working, you know, physicians working the midnight to seven shift and, and you know, and or whatever it may be, I think we need to, we need that flexibility. So um, I know trying to figure out which is the better option based on all the evidence. So I feel like I'm at a point now where I just want to keep hearing from folks who, you know, all the stakeholders find out who sort of what all of the evidences and then you know even something as simple as like you know there's 10 positives here and there's 11 positives here this is the one we go with that's the way it has to be but um, I definitely see both sides very clearly have solid arguments for changes or lack thereof well and even if the, the students in my mind had three days here and two days there 
I think we always. could figure that out. Right. But those are not, that, that's not our issue. I mean, I, I did bring this little, I, I, just as a visual, <laughs> because I think it's hard to picture. I know people want to watch it. Yes. This yeah. is what the list looks like at the end. This is last Wednesday's list of students who did something different. So over here, you see, these are the names of the kids who were going to be a pickup, and this is the list of kids who did something other than what was expected. So flexibility to choose a Monday, Wednesday, Friday thing is not what, what I'm you're worried about. questioning. And so will our busing making this adjustment, I'm sorry, I'm totally monopolizing okay. the conversation, but um, making an adjustment to our busing transportation may not necessarily solve that yeah. problem because I'm, you know, I send the note in and say I'm going to pick my son up today because I have 47 other things that have yeah. to be done and I can't wait for the bus. So, yeah, I mean, that's a separate transportation problem. Maybe it is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, Mrs. Carver, the sheet that you showed, the one on the left are the notes from home and the ones on the right are... Actually, no. These are the ones that don't have to write a note. Okay. Because this is their permanent plan. I see. I see. So, we keep track of it to say, I think this was a Wednesday, mm -hmm. so we keep track of it to say these are the children that always on Wednesday have this routine. I see. And these are the children whose routine changed that So, day. that's the notes from home. And uh, or with calls the, or emails, or calls. yep. Right. And, and I guess, uh, you know, I echo what uh, Jen was talking about. I have I had to commute to Boston, um, and I used to really cherish that flexibility to work from home and that time to be able to be at the bus stop and receive my son. That's very, that was very important to me, to be able to hug while I'm on a call. Um, so I, I completely understand that aspect. And to your point about the safety and the notes from homeless that you're talking about, uh, will we be able to address that, you think, with what we are trying to do here? It, that, I think that's a really good question. I don't know. Um, and I think one of the suggestions that a uh, couple of parents made was about the digital age and being able to use technology. Of course, that would mean funding, right? for those devices and the app, apps that maybe can be put at different points. And I think it was you who was saying that we want that flexibility, but there's also the safety issue and the chaos. How can we find that solution? So is there some technology that we could possibly use, and what would that mean? Would that you know, add additional burden? And with the growth in town and with you know, the budget constraints that we have, will we be able to achieve it? So these are some questions on my mind. Okay. I, I think, I believe that Mr. Ghosh had had some, I don't know if he's here. He is. Had had some conversations several years ago, <laughs> sorry to put you on the spot, with some possible, I mean, there's always programs out there. We do utilize technology like Google Sheets and Google Forms, and in our building, we're putting up the lists up all the time, and students are expected to read it because unlike the lower levels, the students go to those locations without a staff member. The staff members are at the locations. Um, so we do utilize technology on a regular basis. It's the phone calls that come in where the, it's changed and having the number at a dismissal time that is um, very disruptive. But I would also say that because we have to do this management, we're talking about our second secretaries, and I don't have a second secretary all day. Um, the majority of their time is spent on, you know, at the beginning of the day attendance, but I would say the afternoons are pretty much completely monopolized with this task. With this management. So when you're talking about um, costs, there's the cost of the bus, there are also the cost of personnel between paraprofessionals that we need to have to help manage all of that, um, the numbers of buses. So if you're talking about three additional buses, you know, that's another management piece. So as far as the paraprofessionals and the secretarial staff to help manage the phone calls, the emails, all <coughs> the, that, that is, a, is another piece. And when you say the staffing, it's the supervision of those bus right. lines. We have right. some bus lines that have 45 children that are getting on that bus. That's not a one-person job. So it's, um, you know, managing that in terms of keeping them safe and engaged while they're waiting for that <coughs> bus to arrive. Even a bus like that takes a, 
a bit to load for our students <laughs> as we work on how you fill those seats. Right. So the paraprofessional so costs are definitely a piece too. Yeah, so your frustration, you know, with some of these these aspects, as I think last week Dr. McLeod had talked about, that our focus is education of the children. Mm -hmm. And this adds that additional, lay, you know, thing that everybody has to get to. I see Mr. McCann uh, always standing there, and you know, uh, Mrs. Dubow is always standing there. So we completely understand that. And so, how do we find that solution? And now, if we try to make this, um, you know, five days a week, I think another parent had brought this up. Besides the long list of notes from home, now you likely have some more, and those challenges around you know, the parking and going around, how can we solve for this and, you know, not cause so much stress for all of you at the end of the day? Um, so we'll, I guess we'll have to be creative with the solution. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like looking to area towns is a, a good um, way to see how they've handled it because mm -hmm. I think we've all come from other districts. We mm -hmm. all are working moms ourselves and mm -hmm. two mm -hmm. working homes. And so I think we all have struggled with these transportation issues as well. Um, I would say in the districts I've been in, I've never seen it as challenging as it is in Hopkinton. And I've been in, you know, two working communities. And, and there are times that we're waiting with kids. We recognize a lot of parents work far away. Um, there are times where our secretaries are sitting there because they want to make sure that a student is safe and we're waiting for a parent who you know, is coming from Boston and tell, so that's, you know, another piece, right. uh, again, about the management is when a child is, is, is waiting because there's been a mix up, it's sometimes 45 minutes to an hour. And I guess I'm just thinking out loud about, is there a possibility for some kind of handheld devices that could be provided? Would that make that easier? But again, it's the cost, the funding and, and the restrictive uh, budget. Well, and I think we have a tool that we're using to collect the information. Okay. Um, but the problem is is that it comes at a time when it, you know, if we were, if we said every morning by 8 p.m., you, I mean 8 a.m., you had to have your information in, then maybe that would solve some of our safety issues. I think that the part of our concern, it, this is aside from the cost of additional buses, is that the information trickles in all day. So even if we had, even if it wasn't, in my case, Sue Napolitano sitting by the phone. Even if all of that information was coming to us electronically via a device, someone would still have to act on it unless the kids had a pod that gave them a little, hey, text you, get on the bus today instead. I think that I, I think it's a great idea, but I think we forget that our kiddos are so little that they cannot get that information without a grown up at Elmwood School providing it. So can I ask just a a follow-up to the notes coming in all throughout the day. Am I right in remembering that there actually is supposed to be a two-hour window during which those changes to transportation are supposed to be made? So we have a cutoff. Yeah, okay, a cutoff. Cut cut two o'clock. like I said, there's a lot of emergencies in town. So, so it's, it, that is what we typically get because we'll say, is this an emergency because it's past the time? Yes, it is an emergency. So we're not going to get into the details of the emergency or argue with a parent, but everyone says it's an emergency. So, it so would maybe we have to say, we're not taking them anymore. And sorry, you know. I, I guess I'm thinking in my head, would it be easier to back the cutoff up a little bit so that 2 o'clock for a 3.15 dismissal is not a lot of time for a note to come in, even if you're within the window? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what would make it easier. It's a separate issue from the one we have in hand, but it seems it does seem like teasing that piece out would certainly make it easier to address the issue we do have at hand. Mm -hmm. Is that can I yes? Ask? Yeah, I think we skipped over John. Sorry, so to, this is Carver. To you, the list that you have there, so which is a great example. Our list. So, is that are they students who are chain? Like, what's the scope of those changes? Are those changes that are the child is supposed to go? Um, on the bus to Kidsboro that day and the parents picking them up it or can be. or is can it be they're supposed to go on the bus home but then we're going to switch them to go to Kidsboro um, take bus home today early pickup pick up sitter meeting the bus t uh, yeah take a different bus home today um, go to pick up instead of your bus same bus different stop take the bus home 
go to pick up instead. Take the bus home today. Um, take the bus home today. One, one. So, yeah, so take the bus home today instead of. It, it doesn't say what their okay. regular routine would be, but it, they, it would have to be that they would either stay after for an after school program or um, go to an after, you know, go to, instead of going to daycare, take the bus home today. So, so then that list is mixed, I guess. Yes. Yes. Like mi list. Mixed as far as, so yeah, I mean, it does, so the, as many people have said, I mean, the, the reason why we do, I, I like that we do policy the way we do is because I, yeah. I, I think this has been a, a lot of really good information for us to gather tonight um, because to that, what you just outlined, it seems like the, the some of the, the flexibility that is provided kind of goes beyond even what's in the language of the policy. Um, oh, yes. And so one wonders if that does present the opportunity for a, a, a somewhat of a compromise solution that, that could maintain some of that flexibility but ease the operational burden. Um, hmm. The I don't know what that would be clear. I don't know what that is. Yeah, yeah. But that's <laughs> was, why we're not I voting today. We're going to be all um, done. So, <laughs> all um, of a sudden. The, um, so when you talk about the the the, the staff dedicated to it, and it, it, right, we talk about the bus cost, but there's the soft cost of, of managing this as well. So the paras, the, so it's the secretaries and then paras. But we're talking about educational paras, right? right? And teachers as well. We so so when we talk about lost time on learning, it's not even just necessarily that the kids are out of the classroom, but these are paraprofessionals that we have in the classroom for specific reasons. And if we pull them out a half hour early to manage the bus situation, this is time that they're not educating. And so I think that that's an important consideration too, where even if we have the personnel, it's personnel in some cases that we hired to educate children and we're losing that, that time and resource for them. Um, so that's, uh, I think that's an important data point too. Um, I, I do, I think Jen, your, your football analogy summed it up pretty well in the sense of, uh, we're not even having this conversation if we haven't been doing this. Mm -hmm. Um, in my mind, this isn't this isn't something for all the reasons we talked about that feels like something. If somebody came with this idea to add it, that I'd be open to. The challenge we have, as we see in front of us, is that there are the, the community has come to count on this, and so I, I'm I'm again really I really glad I don't we don't have to take a vote tonight because I'm not. I'm not there yet in terms of, of what I think is the best option. I think that there, there are really strong arguments on both sides. Um, and I'm really hoping we can come up with that middle ground solution that might be uh, amenable to everyone. Um, Susan, so you said it's about 200 students, at 60, so 60 kids per bus. Not that it's going to make a massive difference, but are we talking about up in the bus size next year? I'm, uh, well, I am increasing Look, the size of the bus, yes. But not in the bus bit. It's not going, but that's going to drop in the bucket for drop this kind of cost. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, and I think most of my other questions at the moment have been answered, but yeah, I'm sure I'm going to have more. Okay. Okay, Nancy. So I, this has been interesting. This has probably been the biggest in my time on the school committee, biggest public input that we've had, and I do value that. I, a couple things jump out at me. One is obviously the safety concern and thinking about different ways we can increase the ability to make sure kids are safely where they're supposed to be. Also the time on learning and, and with that pulling as John said, pulling paras out of the classroom is a concern. Uh, the other thing that I also think about is traffic, uh, not just at the schools, but traffic on Hayden Row in particular. And I know that Elmwood has its own share of traffic too, but looking at um, if we have a lot of parents coming in to pick up, that is a concern if we're switching from having them all be bused to being picked up. So I would like to look at maybe a conversation with Kidsboro or with other, I don't know who else provides after school care in the area. Um, oh, Sue has a list. So, but to have a conversation with them to see what the other options would be if we can't work out the ability to bus them for whatever reason, for a number of reasons. Is there an ability to, I had heard the suggestion of having them bust to the daycare place so that they can be picked up there uh, or have a 
daycare van or bus or whatever mm -hmm. run uh, and to look at what other solutions we have and then to to look at everything on the table at once mm -hmm. before I'm ready to or I think anybody's really ready to mm -hmm. make a decision on it. Okay. So I've been sort of keeping notes about all of the points that um, that you all are looking for more information about and there are a couple that I want to add as well. Um, so you know everything isn't about money but money is definitely a consideration I just want to highlight a couple of concerns that probably people aren't aware of so this year already going into the budget we've been asked by the Board of Selectmen to reduce our budget by about $250,000 over the increase that we've been having for the last couple of years which is a, which is a challenge for us um, particularly because we've already had to add staff this year we have a growing population of students and we anticipate having to have more staffing for that just that's just for general information that's that's a challenge that we wrestle with every year and particularly this year going into the next budget um, we, we're facing a pretty pretty big challenge in that regard so I mean if you are only to look at this from a financial standpoint we're basically paying about hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year to accommodate the, the flexibility that all of us value it's I'm not saying it's only a money question I just for context that's about what it's costing the district if you're just looking at the bus time and that's not the soft cost that John's referring to in terms of um, staff time what I what I what I wish we had we had such great feedback from parents what we who we never heard from were the daycare providers I think mr. Kessler gave some great information in other towns about um, different um, strategies that that daycare providers offer in other towns and I, I really feel like we can't solve this problem w without input from them this is it's obviously not our goal to put anybody out of business but at the same time it also is in our job to, su to support their business and they're they're getting transportation to their business and and it works out for our families but if we can have a conversation and you, you said this too Nancy if we have a list of daycare providers that we're already working with um, if we can invite them to a conversation and see what flexibility they have in this regard uh, you know I'm sure they don't understand what our our concerns are um, and they have their own logistics that they need to manage um, because we all have the same priority around keeping kids safe so I really would like to hear from the daycare I don't know if it's possible for them to have a van and do pickups that is a solution in other towns that works well I think um, you know depending on the size of their own parking lot or the size of their own building even for the kids to be bused there every day to be picked up as opposed to being picked up at the school maybe that's a solution I don't know because I don't know all of their different scenarios and I can't solve for that sitting here by myself in a vacuum so I would like for there to be a conversation I, I mean for those of you and who are still hanging in there with us if you can talk to your daycare providers about reaching out to us and if we could work on the list of, of um, organizations that we know that we're already working with and I know that there was a question about the daycare provider that's on site and just so you all are aware that is a public bid process every daycare provider is invited to you know is able to bid on that every year so whether they choose to do that or not or whether they offer the best rates to us or not that's that's something that's open to everybody so please don't think that we're in the business of supporting one over another because we're not um, so I think other than that I mean all of the other points that you guys raised just around just yep go ahead um, so it, it may not it's actually a question I should know the answer to so I'm gonna just bite the bullet and ask it anyway so you, when you were talking about the fee structure Susan so the way we actually used to do this is for any student who had a even one day bus to another facility we charge them a separate fee so that within the, the, the so their, their home they weren't charged for the bus home but if they had any other stop I think that was the hundred and fifty five dollar fee and I'm pretty sure we got rid of that we got rid yeah. of that and we actually and we eliminated all, all bus fees we, are, fees we eliminated all the k-6 bus fees there and no just to be clear the, this thing I'm undecided about I'm not entertaining bringing back the k-6 bus <laughs> fee. So, um, so the um, but but the if there is I, I don't know if there's a consideration as you outlined creating an actual fee that meant something to the cost offset would be seem prohibitive but I don't know if that's something that we can even look at as we go down this because I think it is permissible at least I hope so because we did it for a number of years um, but um, it, it again just an option to keep on the table 
Yeah, I mean, I don't think it would be realistic to ask parents to, I mean, if you're talking about 200 kids and $200,000. Well, right, we but, can't, but we can't, so, yeah, right. That's that's a lot, but it actually has only 100 extra seats because 100, it's 200 well, students. Well, you're right about that. That makes that right? equation worse, actually, for the parents. So I don't think it's fair to ask people to just, uh, you know, I mean, that's a huge burden. But no, I'm not looking for, a, <clears throat> I'm not looking for like a net offset. I'm just saying if there's something, yeah. if, if we get to a point where we want to consider something, it might be an option yeah. to, to and, alleviate. I thought that the number of buses that you can cut down if we went forward with this was one bus. Am I mistaken there? Well, we're not sure. Because of the geography yeah. of, the, of the town, okay. you need to be able to get there and back. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. So you have to always balance the number of riders also with the distance and the time that it takes to do a run. So, if it so without reconstructing the, the routes, but what, a, what, you know, when you look at 200 in the number of seats on a bus, that's just what the equation is. Okay. All right, so highlights from what I heard, and please feel free to add in if I missed something. Our concerns are safety, cost, managing changes within the context of the school day, the impact that that has on time on learning, as well as the educational staff whether or not there is some technology that we can use to improve our management of the system, um, uh, being mindful of not adding additional parent pickup traffic, particularly at Elmwood Center School. We'll be the marathon school before this would be in place, so hopefully that will not be a problem. Um, we have that in mind. Yes. <laughs> um, so in traffic and wanting to potentially consider some kind of a daycare bus fee and um, in addition, getting information from local daycares so that we can understand better how we can work together. It's not for us to tell them how to manage their business, but mm -hmm. so that we can each understand what the considerations are and, and see if we can come up with a creative solution. Because, I mean, we clearly hear that, and, and we all have benefited from it as well, the flexibility that we have provided in Hopkinton, whether we're obligated to or not, is something that's really highly valued and makes a huge difference in people's um, ability to work and manage the safety of their children and get them to and from school. So clearly that's not lost on us. Um, so I think if those are all the highlights, unless anybody has anything else critical to add, I'd like to move on because we can see all of our town partners are lining up um, to get started talking about budget and we still have our MCAS presentation. So. If we're good, I'm going to leave this topic and we'll move. We'll, we'll go back. Okay, so, is the expectation? When is the expectation we'll take this up again? That so Anyways. it's on our agenda for our next meeting, which is okay. November 16th. So, in the meantime, if we can find a way to start the conversation, particularly with the daycares. So, I don't know how best to do you, that. Through you, Jean. Um, just thinking about because we were already planning next the next agenda, yeah. which is why I'm I'm just asking you. Um, we might want to leave, give a little bit more time okay. to explore all of these things if we want to come to the next agenda, uh, to the next meeting and have a fruitful, it feels like a lot of things we have yet to explore and I might suggest that we wait for the first meeting in December, if that's or okay. Or the next, the next one after that is actually November 30th. Yes, so, is that right? Okay. Yeah, I mean, we do have it as a placeholder on our next agenda, but if, if we've added, in particularly in the middle of budget and the superintendent search, have possibly added too many things to the plate. Um, so I was thinking you, for the public yes. to know yeah, what you to will plan all, for in terms you will of the next You all want to watch our agendas. We will either take this up again November 16th, which is our next meeting, or the following one, which would be November 30th. But, and Megan also typically will send out when we're doing a second meeting or a second, a second, meeting. second meeting. Right. meeting, but we haven't... We're not, there's no action. Yeah. So will it be considered a we second didn't, reading? We didn't even really yeah, read it. It's, it's a second reading. You're right. We didn't, we didn't. Read oh. so. just discussed it. So I think we're st we did no action and it's a first reading. Yeah. And so our agendas are posted on our website at least two days in advance of our meeting. So it's on the school committee, on the school district website under the school committee tab if, agendas. If so you would like, we can send a listserv. I we mean, can send a listserv when we'll take it up again. If you want. All right, let's I do that. I think given so, the amount of public interest we, we should do. Send okay. sir. Well, Jean, I have one request. In the technology section, if you can please add software as well as hardware options. Okay. Yep. That'll be great. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all very much for your patience. You're more than welcome to stay for the MCAS presentation and all the rest of the fun, but we understand if you need it to go. And thank you um, to the three of you <laughs> for the after Thank you all. Thank you. Yes. I know. 
<laughs> Can we do implants on the kids? <laughs> Get that in the show's yeah, budget. Yeah. Like, that would just make it easier to see your chip. This is where you go. It'd be so much easier. <laughs> All right, so um, unless anyone has a really critical liaison report. Nope. Okay. Oh, because we just lost, like. Check. <laughs> um, so let's go right into the MCAS report from Dr. Kavanaugh. I hope the principals aren't standing and make us feel better because everybody left. They're no, here for MCAS. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> everybody else is flooded out. While we're waiting, why don't we ask you some MCAS questions? If a if the train leaves the station, I don't know. I don't even know what's on the MCAS. A bus leaves the leaves center school. Center school. Get a bus. bus leaves center school at three fifteen. Encounters X amount of traffic. Yeah, and there's road work that day. K Caitlin had a had a problem with the math workbook the other day that was talking about the, it was an algebraic equation talking about the difference price between CDs and cassette tapes. Oh, oh come on! Really, she had no idea what that was. <laughs> that was in the last <laughs> century. Does she know what CDs are? Lisa didn't have eight tracks. She, knew, she didn't know what both of them <laughs> were. Yeah. Alright, we're ready? I am ready. Okay, go right ahead. So this is the time of year when we get our MCAS results back. They are a little bit later than usual because the excitement of the year is that we have now transitioned, at least in grades 3 to 8, to MCAS 2.0 or next-gen MCAS. Uh, we have left behind the legacy MCAS for all of our grades except for grade 10. Um, in grade 10, they will continue with legacy in ELA and math through 2000 to the spring of 2018 and in 19 they'll transition and in science 2020. So what will we do tonight? Tonight I hope that we can better understand MCAS 2.0 and its scoring. I'm sure that as parents got scoring reports they may have looked a little bit different from um, the scoring reports that you have received in the past. I think we also need to celebrate Hopkinton's successes and I think that as we look at grade levels in schools globally, it's going to be very exciting, the achievement and the growth uh, for all of our students. And then we can also take a look at that and say yes, despite the fact that we have done wonderfully, there are places we can grow in, um, in the Hopkinton Public Schools. So let's start with that question, why MCAS 2.0? Why has the state made this transition? Um, the legacy MCAS did serve us well for a while, but it's 20 years old, it's outdated, and if you look at that second bullet, it doesn't do enough, the state doesn't think, and I think a lot of educators don't think, it doesn't do enough with critical thinking, with the application of knowledge, with the connections that exist between reading and writing, and reading and writing in math as well. So all of those things were sort of missing on the legacy MCAS, and they are starting to uh, come to be on the MCAS 2.0. Um, the MCAS 2.0, and you'll see this in future slides, definitely gives a clearer signal of the readiness for our students for next level learning, for college, for career. This set of tests will be given on a computer, so it actually streamlines things. Uh, we have lots of conversations in the district about paper and printing and going green. Um, there would be a, a ton of paper that would come into schools and exit schools with the old legacy MCAS. We are eliminating that. Um, and then eventually, as I said, we'll have MCAS um, 2.0 in grade 10. I won't read all of those words to you, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that when you got your parent reports, if you got one, uh, they had outlined the differences in the legacy and next-gen MCAS. In, to simplify, with the legacy MCAS, we had four labels. They were advanced, proficient, needs improvement, and warning. And now we have renamed things um, exceeding expectations, meeting expectations, partially meeting expectations, and not meeting expectations. 
So in going from paper to computer-based testing, what happened? When we did meeting expectations, what happened was they set those parameters really based on the online tests. So any district that did online testing, that's how we decided what meeting expectations meant. Everyone was supposed to be doing online testing in grades four and grades eight just, uh, statewide. Um, you can look at that statistic up there and, and it'll say only 93% of the state actually tested in grades four and eight and that's because if a district could exhibit some hardship, you didn't have to do online testing. And then what happened was they calibrated the paper test so that they would match up with the online tests. Yes. Um, if you look down the road a little bit there, districts that stayed with the traditional MCAS seem to have won mathematically. Um, the mean for districts that had stayed with the traditional MCAS was about 52 versus 48 to 49 for um, districts that had transitioned temporarily to park. If we look at the second bullet there to calculate transitional SGP, this was very controversial statewide. Could we or could we not have an SGP score when we had some districts that did paper park, some districts that did online park, some districts that stuck with legacy MCAS, and now everyone is facing a brand spanking new test. So if you look at the last bullet, I got to go to a DESI meeting and Robert Lee, who is DESI's chief analyst, was there. And what he had said was that they first took the park test, the paper and the online, and they equated those. And then they added in the legacy MCAS and they came up with things that they thought were very highly correlated. Would we say that this is super statistically valid? Probably not, but the correlation here he think, ma thinks makes sense. One of the litmus tests that we can do is we can go into different classrooms and typically teachers will have a median SGP score that's about the same. You know, consistently the median SGP score might be 68, 70, 72, 66. It fluctuates a little bit, but what would happen is if we looked at that transitional SGP score, if we can see that they fit with what the teacher has been experiencing in the past, then we probably have something that, that's correlated and somewhat valid to our thinking. And I think that when we look at our SGP scores in the district, we will be very pleased. So I did throw this in just quickly. It's a sample fourth grade problem. And I think this illustrates well that need for reading and writing in the mathematics classroom. And I just chose this one sort of arbitrarily. But it's a three part question. And that first part is the anchor. So what we learn is that Carmen was putting crayons into a cup for her art teacher and she put exactly nine crayons into each cup. When you get to the question in part A, we have to tell, the student has to answer, what is the total number of crayons that Carmen put into the cups? Explain your reasoning. And so what we have to say is that um, we need to have a multiple of nine that falls between 20 and 30 and kids should recognize that the, a multiple of nine that falls between 20 and 30 is 27. So when it says explain your answer, I can't just write three cups and I can't just write 27. I have to have an explanation. So there's that sort of notion that reading and writing in the mathematics classroom is really important to us now. And you can see that the other two are also tied to that anchor in part A. All right, so then it came to that place where we had to assess the student work. There was Desi with hundreds of tests from all over the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, 404 school districts to be exact. And so what they did was they brought in 125 Massachusetts teachers and they asked the teachers to look at student work up against the standards that um, are written in the Massachusetts state frameworks for math, for ELA, um, not for science yet. And as teachers really took those standards and broke them down and saw what the student work looked like, they came to a place where they thought only really about 50% of students statewide are actually meeting the standards as they are written in grades three to eight. So those were students who landed in the meeting or exceeding expectations category. Mm -hmm. One of the things that Robert Lee wants to point out is that when we say 50%, it's not a grading curve and a lot of people like to see it that way. Instead, it's just where those scores fell after the educators set all of those standards. And so what they were really thinking about was that readiness to go to the next level or are children ready to go off to college? One of the things that he also talked to us about is if you took a 
a Fahrenheit thermometer and decided it was 70 degrees outside today, right? If you took the Celsius one, it would say 21. It's the same temperature outside, we're just reading it on two different scales. Kids have not become any more wildly brilliant or any more struggling. What really has happened is now we've got sort of two different measuring sticks that we're using. This is what it looked like when they broke everything down. For exceeding expectations out of the 20 points, a cut score would be at 15. And for um, meeting expectations, the cut score was, was right there just at about uh, the 11 mark. So this um, I debated putting into the presentation, but then it made sense for me to do that. So if we looked at students who were in the graduation cohort of 2013, and those could be kids who were also supposed to graduate in 2012. So how many kids managed to graduate within five or fewer years? Of all the students in the state of Massachusetts, it's 87.7. For low income students, it's 78.3. And for students who are English language learners, it was at 70.9. Now of those kids, how many of those kids immediately enrolled in college in the fall? 61% of kids statewide. So when we look at that 50% mark, and 61.7 of the kids in the state of Massachusetts are immediately enrolling in college, that speaks volumes to maybe really that 50% is not such a bad cutoff place. How many of them persistently stayed in college? You can see again the statistics and for English language learners it was as low as 30.8%. Um, and maybe that's also a good time to talk a little bit about you know, the changing demographic in Hopkinton. We are getting a lot of English language learners and, and so those services that we need to provide are actually quite critical. This is just a quick slide that will show you those kinds of cutoffs. So grade three, four, five, six, seven, eight in ELA and math. Um, the blue represents exceeding, the green is meeting, the orange is partially meeting, and the red are those kids who are not meeting expectations. So you can sort of see that consistency through the state. And here is a Hopkinton score. So before we go on to the celebration, I'll just start with this. These are actually, I would say, probably the very best set of scores we have in the district. That is grade eight, grade eight mathematics. If we look at that, I think, I, it's hard for me to see from way back here, but I think maybe it's like 39% of our kids were um, exceeding expectations, 48 were meeting expectations, 13 were partially meeting, and there was not a child who was not meeting Zero expectations. Percent. Zero percent, isn't that lovely? It's wonderful. And then you can see our historic data. So where were we in 2014, 15, and 16 with the legacy MCAS? We probably were not that far away. In fact, I think that currently with a, I think, perhaps more uh, rigorous approach, our numbers of students who are not meeting and partially meeting has actually declined. So at that point I say, we have a lot to celebrate here, <laughs> and we really do. So I don't know if you want to ask any 2.0 or legacy questions now, or if I should go on to just show you our scores. I have one question on the slide before, the last slide that you showed, if you don't mind going the back. The grade ones? Right, and yeah. you know, it's interesting to see how in the new legacy system, if you're just looking by the numbers, right, how the switch between the green and blues that you see and the light blue and the dark blue, right? Mm -hmm. That's yes. the play there, but when you see the oranges, right, the uh, partially meeting expectations, somehow those numbers seem consistent. Those numbers. From right? year to year, you mean. Right. Yes. And also, so the top line, the top one is the new one, right, the two daughter. It is. So that dark blue for exceeding expectations up top has become much lower, and it has across the state. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's actually a very impressive exceeding expectations score. Sure. I think that they just tried to be more realistic about, so kids are really meeting expectations, that there are much fewer who are, many fewer who are actually exceeding those expectations. I, I guess what I was pointing to was the third one, the partially meeting expectations or needing improvement. Somehow those numbers are seeming similar. Yes. Right, because in, in the old needs improvement, we have 12, 12, and 12, and in right. the new partially meeting, we have 13. Right. Hmm. Is that historical data, is that the cohort, or is that 
grade eight. That is grade eight. Okay, so it's yes. a different so set of kids. It's a different set of kids. It's apples and oranges here. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. All right, so this is where our data gets very exciting. We can take a look at grade three in Elmwood. If you look at that slide, there will be no median SGP score because it's the first year the students take MCAS. But you can look at the achievement scores, and even though that's very small up there, um, the ELA achievement score is either 98 or 99 percent up there. So we are in the 99th percentile for ELA in grade three. If we looked at all of the cities and towns in Massachusetts, the M Elmwood third graders ranked fourth in ELA. 404 districts tested, we were ranked fourth. Yeah. Wow. And I guess I just See, want to sort of make a comment on that. <laughs> I know. And Lauren. And Lauren. Carver. <laughs> I don't think that that happens by accident. Over the last few years, um, in the primary grades, so K1, 2, and 3, there has been an, a huge amount of professional development, an awful amount of money, um, a wonderful amount of, um, I think, uh, teacher time put into this kind of work, research-based teaching strategies. So for example, K to two, we have foundations with fidelity. Uh, we do guided reading through, uh, and we use Fountas and Pinnell benchmarking systems for students who don't appear to be reading at grade level. We do LLI um, for intervention. We have done an awful lot of work with SRSD writing. Uh, we have hired a literacy coach, so we have someone who provides professional development. She goes into classes. She does a whole lot of modeling. She has made all of that BAS testing a whole lot more consistent um, because there can be a bit of objectivity, subjectivity to it. And to promote some more objective kinds of testing, we've brought in star reading this year for the first time. I really think that we have that kind of guaranteed, viable, and rigorous curriculum, curriculum going across ELA in grade three, which is very exciting. And we don't get those scores just in isolation. I think we had K1 and two contributing to that. I think, Dr. Kavanaugh, it's, it's, it's a really good point you make because I, th there's, a, there's too good a chance that because of the change in the test that this presentation becomes about what happened last year. And as we talked about last year when we had a similar presentation for MCAS scores, this is the, these are the results of efforts and investments that we have been making over a number of years to drive these improvements. So just because the test changed, the the outputs are still a result of that consistent investment and improvement that we've made. Yes. And I'm running a risk here. Is this our first full day kindergarten class? Um, it, it could be. I think it is. I think the current third grade is the first. Yeah. Oh, the current, current third grade, grade, right. This is last yeah. year's third they, grade. Okay. Was, yeah. yeah. Okay. But my if I may, I think your point is well taken, and it was where my, I, my, my first reaction to the results um, until I realized that we're still comparing ourselves to the same testing across the state, right. regardless of right. whatever test right. it is. This right. This is right. This is relative right. to, it's yeah. It's still, we're still mm -hmm. right. Yep. ranked right up there. Um, and it's incredibly, incredibly exciting and rewarding and validating um, to all of the work that, that's been taking place mm -hmm. and continues to play, take place um, across the district. And, and I'm looking at these principals sitting here and, you know, just couldn't be prouder because that's, that's the work. You know, L, LLI was brought to the district basically by Vanessa and has been something that's been spread, you know, across the district, and and it's just it's the collaboration of 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 everybody and the work that Dr. Kavanaugh points out that we celebrate with these results. So, yep. Um, do uh, does the MCAS capture the growth in uh, you know the growth from last year to this year? In it does in other grades. It won't in grade three because it's the first time. Okay. So, growth, the growth results. Um, have to be compared between two years, at least two years of performance. Right. 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 And I, I'm wondering if it's coming further down the presentation. Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> uh, the other thing that I'll say about the Elmwood School, um, we, it was Lauren DeBeau who had brought um, to my attention some questions about um, the percentage of absenteeism daily, and the Elmwood School has the very best um, attendance rate in the district as well. Mm -hmm. 
It's very hot. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's great. Mm. Something in it's the water. Carver. You're rocking it. Mm. You just don't, you just don't want to show up every day. It's true. They're building a carver. You should knock on wood. Mathematics, uh, 99th percentile again in achievement, and again ranked fourth in Massachusetts. Wow. Yay. Amazing. Mm -hmm. And I think historically, Elmwood has done very well in, in math, but the ELA scores this year are, are super high. Yeah. yeah. All right, so here's the Hopkins School ELA. I think that they have a um, achievement percentile rank of 88%. And um, the median... SGP score there is a 51. And if we look down to students with disabilities, there's a median SGP score, I think, of 38. And that's one of those places where we are looking for growth, right? So um, anything above 50% is wonderful, a median SGP score. Um, that's, and, and we'll talk about those growth places afterward. But being in the 88th percentile statewide is phenomenal. It's great. Could we mention that this is the first year that kids take computer-based testing? It is. So one of the interesting things, I think, for both grades, well, I think for uh, most of our grades, all of our grades, right, um, this is the first time that they have all ever done computer-based testing. So, you know, if I'm a fourth grader and I'm not always on the computer, um, I may not have those kinds of keyboarding skills. And the other thing is, you know, typically if we have kids doing writing in class with a paper pencil, one of the things that, that we've learned is that the districts who had to use paper pencil or who chose to use paper pencil actually won a little bit in the long composition because if you give children three sheets of paper with lines on them, in their minds they think, I need to fill all of those up. And when I'm writing and looking at a sheet of paper, I write recursively and I'll go back and read a little bit and then I'll write some more and then I'll go back and read a little bit more and, and write some more. But what ends up happening when kids write online is if that writing goes up off of the page, we don't go back and look at it again. And if I start typing in a blank space, I don't think how much have I actually written, how much have space have I filled up. Because when I get done, I'm just done. Mm -hmm. So um, that was one of the things that happened. And yes, I think that it's very challenging for our fourth graders. I think we're also going to see that fourth grade and sixth grade, those are difficult years. And we wonder if those things are also caused by transition. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm really still a primary kid, but I've been put into this sort of intermediate setting and I'm just getting my sea legs, right? I'm still an intermediate kid and I've been put into a middle school setting and it's throwing me a little bit. Yeah, right? very important. Um, the Hopkins School in Math, the achievement percentile was 90%. And the median SGP score was above 50 all the way across the board. Mm. Including um, the special... Uh, yes, needs. including students with disabilities, that uh, was at 52. Okay. Okay. Hopkins grade 5 ELA, an achievement percentile of 91. And again, if we look at students with disabilities, it's at 31. So that's another one of those places where I think, you know, we'll have to do some investigating as, as a district and, and think about what that looks like. But the overall there is really high. 64. 64%. Yes. Yeah. Lovely, yes. Lovely growth. Well, you know, Lovely growth. Oops, I'm sorry. Can I just ask a quick question? When looking at the ELA scores and looking at where the growth with special ed or any particular group of kids was not what we had hoped, the new results, the way I read them for my kids, break down where kids had more difficulty to be able to, would that help be able to trend where the district is not meeting particular needs? They is will that, do that, okay. yes. Um, but I think... You know, in addition to that, uh, we have star reading data for kids at the um, Hopkins School. We have QRI data. We have BAS data. We have SRSD data. So we have all of those things, and it's really just a matter of, you know, getting the right resources to the right kids in the right, you know, settings and those kinds of things. So I do think that um, there's lots of data out there to help us inform instruction. And there's the Hopkins School Math. So they're in the 91st percentile with a median SGP uh, for all students of 57 and students with disabilities of 44. And 
one of the other yes. things that we should mention too is that this is the first year that Hopkins is going to have um, a reading coach. Right now, that reading coach is doing some coaching and some teaching, and hopefully throughout the course of the year, the teaching load will go down and the coaching load will go up. So that's that's sort of how that's set up. And here's Hopkins Science. Hopkins Science scores 30% advanced, 40% proficient. This is legacy MCAS. And when we take a look at how the science is scored in the state of Massachusetts, these are great scores. So here's grade six middle school ELA in the 88th achievement percentile and with SGP scores above 60 across the board. And middle school grade seven ELA in the 97th percentile, they were ranked eighth in Massachusetts with SGP scores um, for all students at 70 and students with disabilities at 59. And in grade eight, we were in the 98th percentile. Hopkinton's eighth graders uh, were ranked fifth in the state of Massachusetts in ELA. And interestingly there, the median SGP score for all students with 68 and students with disability is at 71. Oh, wow. Good for them. And here's the grade six middle school math. Um, the achievement percentile here was 85. And the median SGP was 65 and students with disabilities were at 50. Grade seven students in the middle school were ranked sixth, sixth in, Massachusetts, in math in Massachusetts with an achievement percentile at 97 and SGPs for all students at 75 and 67.5 for students with disabilities. Our L students get, don't get categorized because we have too few to form a cohort. Um, the achievement percentile for grade eight math was at 98. We were ranked, we were co-ranked third in the state of Massachusetts. You've already seen their bar graph, which was phenomenal. And their SGP was at 80 for all students and 74 for students with disabilities. That's outrageous. Carol, is that why the economically disadvantaged children don't get SGPs too? That's because there's not a large enough, enough okay. okay. Yes. Okay. Just curious. Yeah. And then this is just the middle school science scores. We were at 75% um, proficient or higher. Mm. And we can just very quickly look at high school ELA. Um, you won't see an achievement percentile there because they are legacy MCAS people. Um, but we can take a look at their SGP and they were at uh, so just, I should point out that 78% of the kids see. in grade 10 ELA were advanced and 20% were proficient. 1% needs improvement, 1% warning and failing. So this is probably a good illustration too of legacy MCAS and how that works. Um, those scores, if we looked at them up against those eighth grade scores would seem inflated. Right? Uh, so the median SGP was 56.5 and for Students with disabilities, it was at 61. So it was higher than. Here's the math, median SGP 76, students with disabilities 61.5, and 83% advanced and 13% proficient. And here's high school science. This was, um, 72% advanced, 24% proficient. But one of the things we found this year is that um, for the first time in a very long time, we had students who actually fell into that warning failing category. That's an anomaly um, for Hopkinton High School. So it's something that we're looking at um, in terms of instruction this year for next year. What happens with kids that fall into the warning failing in the 10th grade? So those are students who will need to retest. Okay. So, and then the issue with science is that for ELA and math, there'll be November retests, March retests, and then they can take it again in June. For biology, there's just one February retest. So that's their next chance to take the test. All right, so then we ask ourselves, how do we take this information and use it to, to help our students grow? Because that's really the important thing. And so we have some global information that we can use. So for example, if we take a look at grade six, we might ask ourselves that question of, you know, why are our achievement levels in grade six ELA and math 88 and 85? 
although we could look at the SGPs and say that, you know, they're kind of holding their own there. What would it, we need to do to ensure that we had um, fewer students, for example, in the partially meeting expectations category? If we looked at subgroups and we talked about this, like what are we going to do with um, targeting instruction for students who are um, students with disabilities or students who are on IEPs? And then we can also do student review. So if I had left student names on there, on the left-hand side, you would see all of the students' names. And I think that this is a group of students who may have fallen into that you know, partially meeting expectation category. So if we do something like look at the arrows on the left, we can wonder why it is that those students were getting questions two, three, and four wrong, or questions one, three, and four wrong, which begs the, we, we need to look at, at, the, um, at the question to see what it does. <laughs> Another thing that we can do, and this is um, student-based as well, we can take a look at that column where you see fours, threes, twos, ones, zeros, and blanks, right? As we look at those columns, we can decide, well, what was the, what was the writing task? And how is it that one student got a four, one student didn't answer, another student got no credit at all? What did those responses look like? So these are the first three questions, which would help us to make those kinds of determinations. You don't have the text to which they are tied, so that's not very helpful to you if you wanted to answer them. <laughs> you can't. Would the teachers get access to the text, or the parent, the students, would they be able to see the text and then be able to look yes. at the questions they want? Okay. Yeah. Um, and um, we also have access <coughs> to um, the student essays for grades 4, 8, and 10. So when you take a look at the writing that's in that box there on the left-hand side in the orange box, that's actually a Hopkinton student's writing. I just pulled one up and, and, and there it is. The kids were asked to um, talk about the similarities and differences between To Kill a Mockingbird and A Part of the Sky. How are these two characters uh, both similar and different? Interestingly, our eighth graders would have just read To Kill a Mockingbird, so that would have been very helpful to them, but they would not have had access ever before to A Part of the Sky. So the two portions of those texts that we would want kids to look at were actually given to them. So they would read excerpt A and excerpt B. So big question, how are we prepping for online testing in third grade? And hopefully we will be prepping both second graders and third graders so that when those second graders become third graders, they're ready for online testing. When the third graders get to the Hopkins school, they should be better prepared to take an online test. So these are some of the tools we have um, at the ready. We have not actually implemented them yet, but that is uh, on the docket for coming days. So there's a product called Edulastic. It's entirely free. And it's an online um, assessment tool. You can make your own assessments with them. But what it does is it mimics the actual kinds of test questions that you would see on the MCAS 2.0. One of the things that Kathy Anasaskis had done at the middle school this year is they had created about 20 common assessments throughout the year in mathematics that would actually use Edulastic. So our kids, even though they're very prepared mathematically, a really nice thing is they were also prepared to take that test because they knew how to wield the tools. They weren't kids who walked away saying, that test was confusing. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other things that we'll do is um, have kids do more reading, maybe Encyclopedia Britannica, which is an online tool, but what it'll help kids do is to understand online text features and some of those tools that they are able to use when they're reading online as opposed to reading with a pen or pencil in their hands. And then the last thing, of course, is we have Type to Learn. It's a cloud-based tool. Um, kids can practice this at home. All you need are your login credentials. And uh, Neely Bartley, who is the tech integration specialist at Elmwood, has those. So any parent who is interested in having their child practice at home, you can. Uh, the other thing, though, is you know, we don't expect that parents will be responsible for this. We are certainly uh, going to start type to learn at Elmwood consistently for kids. And this is the part where I thought I'd sneak in my own addendum, if I could. <laughs> So we talked about um, that product, or it's not really a product, it's um, radar that the state has put out. And so I just thought I would show you three different things that are radar reports. These are all the same report, but they are run just a little bit differently. Um, In this one. Dr. Kavner, is there any way that this could be maximized? It's very hard to. Can you read it now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that better? I think, is the 
most important part that Hopkinton happens to be at the top? That's, that's yeah. what I was pulling Is that your point? <laughs> so don't want to miss that. Uh, well, we may have to. Just yeah. the control plus thing. I think thing there's more. a zoom. Yeah, you are in luck today. Make that a little bigger. We can make sure that everybody gets copies, Carol. And will this be posted to the website as well for parents? If to you want. Yes. yes. Please. That's great. That might be as big as it gets. Yeah, I think that's the best we're going to do. Or maybe I, I can move up front. Is it, is the, are the numbers critical for what you're going to talk about, or are you more showing us the... Yeah, I'll just show. All right. And, and then we'll put it on the website yeah. so everyone okay. has access to it. Sounds good. Thank you. All right, so, yeah. This first one is comparisons by choice. So what I did was over in the blue column where you see all of those other communities, I just chose them. I chose some of them because they were close by. I chose some of them because they are allegedly high performing. And I just thought it would be interesting. <laughs> allegedly. allegedly. <laughs> we all they like allegedly. Themselves. They think of themselves in this way. <laughs> I can say allegedly high performing because if you look over, we are really doing a beautiful job right. there in comparison with those folks. <laughs> or perhaps I can be fresh and say in contrast with them, right? Fresh. Um, so that is quite quite lovely and it also gives us our per, pu per pupil expenditure so uh, where we have 89% um, proficient or higher in ELA there's another district that also does their per pupil expenditure is $22,000 per child and ours is 13785 what a good segue that was thank you I Dr. Kavanaugh mm -hmm. well, so I can also do this no <laughs> seriously <laughs> I, yeah, I'm not, not. not trying to be <laughs> about it. I'm, I'm really serious. I love these reports, you know. Yes. So this is one that does it by demographic, students who are most like ours, and we use things like how many kids do we have in our district, how many, what percentage are economically disadvantaged, what percentage are students with disabilities, and what percentage of students are Ls. Um, and again, you can see that we are faring very well on that report. Yes. Meaning, meaning are we have low percentage? Do you mean based on performance? They compare you, they compare our performances, but it's based on the types of children that go to school in those districts. Right. right. So, so regardless of those categories, we're still performing well? Yes. Is that okay. very well? Are, are we in the top because we're performing better than the ones below us or because you, you've selected us? Because the state, when we get our radar report, whoever you are goes on top. Okay. But our ELA is 60, and only Medfield has a 63, and maybe Sharon or Walpole has a 60. Everybody else is not where we are, right? Hmm. Uh, mathematically, we have 65, and that is the highest one in the list. Oh, those are the SGP scores. I should be careful. Oh, wow. Yeah. Even more impressive. Yes. And then the last one is comparison by budget. So these are um, based on, and it, it will tell you there, but... Uh, uh, median family income and um, our uh, sort of our, our town's capacity to fund a budget. Uh, so you can see our per pupil expenditures and you can see our test scores and you can see our enrollments and those kinds of things. Oh, cool. So our, our um, financial counterparts, if you will, are the people who are over on the left hand side. Our financial counterparts are like Burlington, Danvers, Dartmouth, Longmeadow. And part of the so what here is from our last meeting when we talked about the other product, you're showing us those radar reports that are available to us already right. free right. Yeah. that can cut and slice this data in different ways yes. for us. That's okay. what I'm showing us. Yep. Thank you. That's all. Excellent. Does anybody have questions or we ask them all along the way? I asked all mine during. Asked mine this is yeah. amazing. Yeah. Just, you know, um, you. all the work that you have done pulling all of this together. I mean, data tells you the story, of course, if it's collected cleanly and, you know, um, which clearly it has here. So it's amazing to see that. And the fact that the work that you're doing is data driven, that you're looking at the data and then looking for areas of improvement and working on, on those areas. Yeah. You know, we are very, very good. Excellent. Yes, yeah. yes. You know, Allegedly, we are among the best. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, but thank you. I think even with the transition to the new test, so that we don't, so this really is sort of do over baseline year, I think the comparison that we have to the rest of the state for this year is remarkable. But um, 
you know, in addition, I think the emphasis um, on all of the other tools that we have available that we use constantly to be working on where kids are needing improvement is, is a great reinforcement. Um, it's not only MCAS that we use to make those decisions. So that was, that was very thorough. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I have one last uh, remark for you, which is my favorite topic, is um, besides some of the areas of improvement, when children are in the bucket of exceeding expectations, what are we doing? What are the tools that are available to challenge them? And uh, what is it that we do with those children? Yeah. And I think that that, too, is one of those areas that, you know, Looking we need at. to look at. Okay. Right? Great. Thank you so much. And congratulations and to yes, our educators. Absolutely. Thank you. So very very much. Much. So on the theme of money well spent, we're going to start talking about money in a minute here. So I have to do very quick business with the chair report and read that um, I have approved for payment the accounts payable warrants 18-021, 18-022, and 18-023, and all warrants have been included in your materials. I have approved for payment the payroll warrant S18009. All warrants have been included in your packet. And then as we shift seats here, I'll just also announce um, regarding the superintendent search, I checked with our director of human resources on my way over here and she had been in touch with our um, search firm, as you know, or you may remember, the application deadline for the superintendent search was Halloween. That's maybe a mean thing, but it was <laughs> Halloween. And um, the search firm is not done compiling all of the applications, but as of this afternoon, they had 23, and we're still working on others. So I have no doubt that we will have a very strong pool, and we are meeting next week. So we have some members of our screening committee with us here in the audience um, to start that process. So it's it, we're on a very aggressive timeline and hoping to make a decision by uh, the end of December. So all that said, we are ready for the superintendent's uh, preliminary budget overview. So mm -hmm. we have our town partners here from Board of Selectmen and Appropriations. We're missing one chair, but if mm -hmm. one of you wants to drag a chair and come up, you can see the presentation better and obviously oh, ask whatever. Mr. Ghosh. See, now we're not even missing a chair. Uh, there's room for everybody, so please come up and join us. You can see better from up here, and we obviously welcome your questions. And Claire, please come up. I know you're not a regular person, but there are only two of you, so it's still allowable. So I will just chairs, right? Yeah, that's the downside. It's hard to move. They're not as, yeah, but it, they'll wake you up. You were in the cozy seats for a while there. Those are nice, yeah. <laughs> well, you just did see an MCAS movie. Yes. Absolutely. It was entertaining. I know. Nobody likes data. She makes it pretty, too. She does. I like that we're always at the top. All right, so if we're all settled, Dr. McLeod, if you would like to. This is a joint presentation right. with myself and Susan Rothermick. Um, it's been a pleasure uh, working on the budget to, to, to this point. Uh, Susan's been, been really great to work with. Um, the most important word on the screen in front of you is preliminary. <laughs> so, um, but before we begin, I, I just want to speak about the process to date um, in terms of, you know, beginning with the meetings that we've had, the collaborative meetings we've had with the Board of Selectmen, appropriation, um, working together to look at the budget um, and, and discuss openly where we are as a district. Tonight's presentation is the result of hours and hours of discussion um, with our leadership team. Um, and then after preliminary discussions, having people go back to the drawing board, really challenging each other with where we're at, what we can be doing differently, um, to work towards the goal that was set for all of us, which was a 3.5%, no, no more than a 3.5% increase overall. Um, so that's the, old, that's the, the broad view. Uh, this is not something that has been shared with the school committee at this point. So what we are really looking forward to tonight is your feedback to your questions, to what you notice. Um, obviously, you are all aware of our budget calendar and the fact that we have many meetings scheduled in the weeks going forward 
where we'll be drilling down into the details of each of the departments and each of the different schools budgets so this tonight is a broad overview um, so the budget highlights and this is an important slide to to um, to really review because this is what this is the lens that we bring to the conversation so obviously the first and most important driver for us as we build the budget and recommend the budget to the school committee is to maintain the instructional programs and staffing that result in the reputation that Carol just reviewed. These are fabulous results and we did not at all practice. So, um, but, but in all seriousness, this is what our town expects. This is what our school committee expects. This is what you've been supporting as we've developed the budget over the past I can only speak of when since I've been here. So this is the fifth budget that I've brought to you. And the results speak for themselves in terms of what you've been supporting through the budget and what our instructional programs have been able to achieve. We're all very proud. Uh, we are a high-performing school district that other districts and surrounding towns compare themselves to. We hear this over and over in many, in many different ways. Um, but what's most important is that this is what our town expects. And so any budget that, you, that we present to you is going to always have the instructional programs and the staffing that result in those programs as the first priority. Um, and of course, a sub-bullet to that overarching bullet is meeting the needs of all students and learning styles. Um, another highlight is the restructuring that occurs every time we bring a budget to support continuous improvement. So, being the best is what we expect, um, or being very high, but always uh, continuing to look at our programs and, and how can we improve them. And the restructuring piece means that every time we look at a budget and, and requests are being made for changes and restructuring, the questions that we're always asking is, what are we giving up then? If, if we're adding on, what are we giving up? Um, so that's what we talk about with continuous improvement. And then something that's been brought to our attention and that we've been really looking to rebuild is, is this piece around school facilities. So I believe that a very important part of the achievement and the, the maintenance of the instructional program are the facilities that support effective instruction. And so we're all really excited, of course, about the opening of Marathon School next fall. Um, that will be, there are going to be obvious implications. The changes that you're going to hear about and that you've seen evidence of with buildings and grounds, that, that costs money. Um, so there's, there is a priority within buildings and grounds and their budget this year. Um, some, some projects that we've started to speak about with the school committee around a campus paving project, looking at evaluating the uh, traffic around our campus as, as traffic grows and enrollment increases. Um, bus parking, something that we've been talking about over the past couple of years. Um, fields is a big topic, so you're going to be hearing more about that. And then underneath the supporting of effective instruction, of course, is the ongoing expense um, and improvement of technology and safety. So those are some highlights. Um, maintaining the current extracurricular programs, of, uh, also of great value to the community. Um, and an increase and a um, budget highlight, I think, for all communities uh, is this idea or increase around social-emotional learning programs and then the wide range of elective opportunities that we offer to our students is something that we also take pride in and has come to be an expectation. Uh, the other thing we wanted to plan out before we, or, or point out before we continue is that, as always, our strategic plan drives our budget. So our budget decisions and the things that people bring to us and the requests that are being made of us, we are always going back to the strategic plan to see whether or not they are in line with what we have stated as our priorities. So the things that I'm calling out on this slide are priorities that you have approved for the, the, the upcoming school year. So ensuring this alignment, the school improvement plans that you approved, that you knew and, and we presented how they were aligned with the school improvement plan, the things that you see pointed out here, instructional coaches, additional L staff, adjustment counselors, what you see in front of you, and then um, the START program that we now, ha now are required to fund because it's at the end of its um, grant funding 
um, are all things that were within our strategic plan. And then the other things that you see on this bullet, on, on this slide. Okay. So um, Dr. Cavanaugh just went over the performance highlights, so I don't have to um, spend any time on this slide. And we've talked about this before, but it seemed very timely to include it here tonight. The state average is at the top around per pupil, and you can see where we fall. Um, with some of the surrounding districts, obviously we had another slide that, that showed districts, districts that were in the 20s. It didn't seem really very pertinent. But these are districts that we compare ourselves to, neighboring districts, and where they fall um, and where we are within as, as compared to the state average. Um, this is a really interesting slide and please stop me anywhere along the presentation. Sue and I are more than happy to jump in. Um, the actual enrollment on the left, the projected NESDEC enrollment that was given to us in November of 2017. 16. You will be hearing from NESDEC at, at, next, at our next meeting. Um, so we will have updated projections, and this is why I said the, bit, the budget was preliminary, because what we're going to be talking about tonight is based on what we know about enrollment. You can already see how f that the projected FY19 is, is clearly below what we currently are facing, and that's without any increases. Um, obviously, the NESDEC projections are going to be adjusted, and we're going to be here seeing some additional numbers. But as we've talked about with, this, with all of you over the past um, many months, we have trends that have shown consistently that we have had changes between the projections and our budget planning and then what we actually have coming to show up at the door in September. The challenges that that presents was illustrated this year with, with Lauren DeBow, who came to the school committee, who came to me and Susan, um, basically re requesting additional staffing through paraprofessional support because of her numbers. And there was nothing she could do because she didn't have additional classroom space. But what happens when we don't plan ahead is that not only do we have to now change classes, class lists have to change. Um, but also planning for special support. So if we have additional class sections, now we have to, it changes everybody's schedule, but it also changes the numbers of art, music, a library, how many sections that they can cover and increases within there. So we really need to plan ahead reasonably around what we know we, we can be expecting and what our trends have been showing us that even within the next NESDEC projections, in some grade levels, we've been well beyond that. And now is our opportunity to really get back to what we value coming into our new marathon school, looking at class size 18 to 21 in the K2 um, grade levels. And Dr. McLeod, would you happen to have what was projected for FY18, at least the total? Yes, Sue has that. Do you have it handy? Why don't I go on while she finds that? Sure, thank okay. you. So this is the budget overview, add the word preliminary, <laughs> including all of our special education costs. We always know that we have to start somewhere. Obviously this increase, this percent increase is after, as I said at the beginning, many, many hours that we've already put in to, but we know it's preliminary and in no way do we know that this is, this is a, something that we can work with. Uh, but we presented tonight to show you where we are at a preliminary level, including special, all of the special education out of district costs. If we remove the out of district costs that have been discussed and explained, um, and Sue will jump in here for us, it decreases the percent increase already by 2%. So you can see how much those out of district costs add to the overall budget planning. Um, did you get that number? Yep. So if, you, if we looked at the um, NESDEC projections for this year, the total from that slide would have been 3527, and our actual is 3561. So you can see where that delta has, has caused issues for us from a, from a budgetary standpoint. 
So they're clearly not projecting that we're decreasing our enrollment. They just were off with what they. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, right. They, yeah, they did not project a decrease. Right. And which is what this slide would indicate. But we're just showing current, and then what they had projected back in 2006. And just for everyone's sake, how, as we all I think can agree that it's not going to decrease next year. There's an there's also an anomaly number on there, which is that the preschool is projected to go up significantly yeah. because right. we're going to be having more sections oh, at the marathon school, I'm right? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, John. Oh. That number wouldn't be NESDEC. That's not. That's projected. I'm so sorry. But still, doesn't that work into the total? It does work into it the total. Yeah, sure so does. I'm saying we, the, the projection we have up there is a net decrease of four, but that's with adding <laughs> right, right, right. 28 additional right. preschoolers, which means we're further off. We are further off. They right? they right? so that's, have added that. Yeah. Right. You're right. right. Yeah. Yes. Right. So it just, you know, it shows you the difference as, as Dr. McLeod has been right. saying. I can never keep up with his numbers mind, you know. Our actuals well, have been running way yeah. beyond the yeah. projections. And, and that preschool is because we're going to add another section because we can, because we have the room. Yep. Yeah. But this is why it's important to look at our own data because we start this process so far in advance of even getting, I mean, you guys have been working on budget for two months and we don't even have the NASDAQ projections yet. Right. So, um, so uh, Dr. McLeod, as you talk about this delta, does it matter where that delta occurs, like, you know, how, where the projections are off, where that falls? Like, I, I recall you saying that if it's high school, we are able to manage that. Oh, it that. matters a lot. So if you can speak to that also a little bit as you go along, that will help. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, Sue, would you man mind jumping in here on, uh, and for the sake of just review, the difference between including the special education out of district and the overall increase and this right here what would it mean in terms of what what parts of what, what what's being left out here between these two numbers so the 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 difference between those two slides really is um, we have kind of a, a more than an unexpected jump in out of district uh, tuitions from 18 to 19 as you know in 18 we've already had to address um, several changes in, in student needs that we've had to do budget transfers for. So we're covering them for this year by doing budget transfers, but they just carry over into, into the next year. So what happens if you're able to break out um, the out-of-district tuitions and, and address those separately, the reason you want to look at that a little bit is because you would have to cut all the other departments just for that change in, in student need, which is really, again, out, out of control of, of the district. And, you know, it just becomes um, kind of a, you know, an extraordinary percentage of the budget and an extraordinary piece of the change. So we're trying to separate that from the conversation. Well, and just for people who haven't been here f before when we've talked about it, that is a result of a couple of things. One, we've had more students, more out-of-district place placements than we expected. We've had more students moving in to town who already are outplaced, right. which was not even, we just now inherit that cost. And the reimbursement rate from the state has gone down by like 10% over the last two years. So kind of all of those things combined have is what has made such an unusual year for us. That's it's not correct. usually like this. Right. So we, we rely on other funding sources for the budget, um, grants revolving, and one of the pieces that we rely on is Circuit Breaker. Um, so Circuit Breaker is always in arrears, so we're receiving Circuit Breaker this year for students' uh, costs last year. And again, as a reminder that you get a percentage above a threshold. So the threshold is about 43000 Above that, the costs you get, depending on the year, the state reimburse you a, a percentage. And that can be anywhere between, you know, typically it's around a 70%. It can be, you know, 73. Um, but this year we're down to 65. So over the last couple years, and that's what Jean is alluding to, over the past couple years, our percentage reimbursement rate decreased dramatically. So that changed our receivable, even though maybe our students didn't change so much, but our cash flow changed. So we're, we're getting hit with that in addition to, um, you know, additional student changes. Does this budget, what percentage are you expecting for circuit breaker 
to the proposed budget? So we're, we're proposing right now to use 300000 of funding from Circuit Breaker. Right. And, but as you project next year, are you, are you projecting like a 60% reimbursement or, or? Well, so I'm projecting the 65 again. So this year is 65. I'm projecting the 65 again, just to be conservative. So as we think about the overall budget, putting everything together, 2% going up for this particular need is 1% for all of us, using simple math, 50-50, mm -hmm. right? So just split it. I mean, it's a 1% increase right up front that you know, we can't say no to, so. Mm -hmm. Right, it's not something we overall, can, you know what I mean? we can't just cut it. We don't have Legally the ability bound, to yeah. do that. Legitimately, you cannot say no. Right. Yeah. Okay. Not that we would want to either. Yeah. If you're a special yes. education parent, I've just. But. But are you considering bringing some of the students in house development program? Have you looked at the cost? Um, oh, and and it. So, Rebe Rebecca, it's it's never about cost in term. It's always about whether or not we can provide appropriate programming. So we are always striving. It's a goal con constantly to be bringing students back in. Um, and, and, and developing programs that can meet their needs or developing programs within the district so that they don't have to go out to begin with. It's something that we're always looking at whenever we do an annual review, whether or not the student is able to come back. Um, so that, that's something that's always on our minds. Um, so many, the students that we cannot provide for, we simply don't have programs for um, to meet their, their disabilities. Um, often there's medical medical needs that we simply can't meet, um, behavioral, emotional needs, students that we haven't been able, that we've tried to program for within the schools that we just simply don't have the expertise. And the, the hope is always that with, with time in a special setting that they'll be able to develop and grow until to a point where they're able to come back and be successful within the school. So yes, yeah. Um, this is just, you see this every year, so we included it. It's just a, another way of reinforcing that the, the, obviously the majority of the budget is always around payroll. Um, certain, certainly the, the um, negotiated increases that are already what we are dealing with. But also, as I said on the first slide, staff is what drives the educational program. Um, so the 80% really is just showing that there is a disproportionate amount of expense this year driven by the costs that we are already discussing around special education, also transportation, mm -hmm. uh, Sue, and there was one third one you said. Um, so maybe- uh, Utilities. That's right, additional that cost around utility um, that interestingly enough has to do with the marathon school, right? Yes, so the engineering, um, and I guess way back to the original budget that was shared uh, around the, the marathon school, one of the numbers that was a very large increase is the utilities for marathon. So while gas went down a little bit, um, the electric went way up. So that's the projection for the marathon school. And then transportation? Transportation, we're going out to bid. Uh, so this, is a, this will be a new bid. I based the numbers on, you had done a bid two years ago, and you had the numbers from that bid, and actually they were so significantly higher that you opted to stay with the two additional years that was on this contract year. So looking at those numbers that uh, were given to you in that bid two years ago, I made adjustments to this bid um, based on that and also based on where surrounding communities have landed in terms of what their bus costs are. So it is a high number that's in the budget right now, I hope to get that bid out in the, you know, and get a more solid number in the next couple months. Um, but right now, to be conservative, I am looking at what the costs that were given to you two years ago. Susan, the driver on the utility difference on Marathon, I mean, is it that the, the building can just handle more from an electricity standpoint than Center does? So there's more pull, it's a larger building? So it's 30,000 square feet larger. Right. Um, but the other, because I, I asked that question too. So you're putting in a lead building. Yep. You know, why are you your utilities so much higher? And the answer that I was given is basically the 
configuration of center school right now, the lighting and, and everything that's going on, you know, your lighting is below code in terms of what you're providing, um, your utilities and, and all the um, infrastructure that you're running, you know, is barely running. So this is, while it's a lead building, it's providing all that, you know, and of course you have the external lighting, you have the LEDs and everything else, but the utilities are still driven. So is the, elect is the electricity more consistent with other schools? In when you look at it from a square footage standpoint, yep. it is. So it was running sort of on the low end at center, and now it's just becoming, adjusting to be more commensurate. It, it's basically what would be okay. for that size. That makes sense. Thank you. So a little bit about personnel increases because although uh, if we just go back and we look at we're still around the same percent of the overall budget, um, the increases that really we are looking at are the at the elementary teacher level that really and the specialists that are driven by what I just said that when you increase classroom uh, teachers you have to increase specialists to go with it to cover the additional sections. A typical specialist can cover um, 24 sections so if I am so if there are 24 classes within the school 12 of each grade level 12 third grade 12 fourth grade 12 fourth graders one art teacher could teach all of those classes within their schedule but if it starts tipping above that then it would then we start looking at additions and so this 2.0 is bits and pieces it's point two here point two there Point four here, so to a, a total increase of 2.0. The elementary teachers, five at the Marathon School, um, two at the Elmwood School, and one, um, one at the Hopkins, Hopkins. School. Um, those are all driven by enrollment, and the numbers that we're catching up with both from last year, where we were not able to make the changes, when they happened over the summer and we were not expecting them and then what we're expecting for next year. So the school committee will recall that we may do with larger class sizes than we would have wanted at center school because we didn't have room. At the Elmwood school because we weren't expecting them and we made the decision coming in at the end of the year, at the beginning of the year, when they did during the summer that we were going to make do. Um, but it certainly was less than ideal and um, is something that we are certainly prioritizing as we look at the budget and other ways, other places where we might make cuts, a place where we don't want to have to do that is at the classroom level. So the, the majority of this is around elementary teachers and the specialists that would go with it. The adjustment counselor you'll see, you already know about and are expecting the increase to the START program at the high school um, of a 1.0 and then an additional adjustment counselor at the Elmwood School really to be um, helping with the addition, the, the social emotional learning piece. Um, we've talked a lot about BCBAs and behavioral adjustments and the needs uh, for guidance at the, at the elementary, based, especially the lower elementary level. There just is not as much support for the increasing emotional and behavioral um, challenges that, that students are dealing with at a much younger age than we have ever seen before. It's, it's quite startling. Um, and uh, the needs of students that can impact an entire classroom, um, an entire day on the part of an of a administrator. To be able to manage, prevent, and help students to grow and deal with challenges, emotional behavioral challenges, um, takes a lot of work and we want to be able to help students who have those kinds of challenges. It really is surprising when we start to see them surfacing at such a young age, but we are definitely seeing them. Um, you'll hear more about the math coach that's at the Elmwood School level and Vanessa will be speaking about why that's so important at her level. Um, the additional custodian is really to look at the additional square footage at the Marathon, the marathon School um, and to keep us up to code and make sure that we keep this brand new building the way it needs to be um, kept. I know that both Tim and Sue are looking at ways of using additional custodians across the district perhaps during um, off school hours or during the summer um, to be able to work together but you all know and have heard the many many um, positive changes that they've made and uh, this is absolutely something that is, is, is going to be needed. 
Um, L teachers, the two teachers that are reflected in this bill in this budget, you've already approved one of them. So this is a budget to budget comparison. One addition was required at the beginning of this year to um, to meet state requirements for the numbers of students that we have. Dr. Kavanaugh has recently informed me that we are no longer considered a low incident district. Wow. No longer. So we are now considered. Uh, what's moderate next? Incidents. Moderate. Yeah. Apparently. Allegedly. 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 Yeah, that's not, <laughs> that's not going to go away. That's going to no. be a theme this year. Yeah, yes. It's going to be out so, of the um, at Definitely one additional, but this is again. I just want to stress: we, you've already one is already current is currently in this budget, and this is a budget to budget um, and I'm sorry, adjustment. Dr. McClellan, so that and if I'm not mistaken, so the L teachers are something that falls into the category of things we don't have a choice about, too, right? If we have a certain number of students, we are required to have a certain ratio of L teachers. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Uh, the facilities use secretary. Um, this is this is an adjustment to meet the needs of some changes that were made when personnel changes uh, happened where basically the person who's in that position was sh did not used to be shared between facilities and athletic director and when we had a change to both of those offices we tried sharing a position the individual who's in that position is just simply not able to meet the demands on the position and so looking at an additional point four um, is, is part of personnel increase. So you can see where the drivers are. Under expense, Sorry, Sue, why don't you jump right in there so that they don't have to listen to me for a change. Can I, <laughs> Sorry, can I yeah, ask please. a question on the last yes, slide? Yes, you can. You did tell us to ask questions during. Right? Please, okay. yeah. And I, I just, just want to make sure I'm, I'm not sorry. Violent. Um So is this, this is gross increase, not net increase, right? So if there are any. This is gross. So if there are any adjustments the other way, we're not, they're not reflected here. And you're correct. Okay. And you will be hearing about all of that too. Okay. And then uh, for, a future version, or maybe this is something that's already on here, what would be helpful when you talked about the specialists, it really resonated for me. If we could get a breakout between what is an FTE equivalent and what's an actual FTE. So like those eight teachers, I assume, are actual eight new yes. FTEs, yes. whereas the specialists are, as you said, we're adding a little here, a little yes, there. Yes, yes. Um, I think that would be helpful as okay. well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you, you, you got that? Yeah. Okay. Um, just as a little example, though, to your question, at the center school, although I just said that we have a need for five additional classroom teachers, her net increase is 1.9. Yeah, that's what I was. So you can see the level of work that's happened within the individual school budgets where there's ins and outs. There's I need five new classroom teachers. Here are reductions that I'm going to be able to make so that my net increase in personnel is actually 1.9. So these uh, are only the ins. Yeah. This is to show you the increases, yeah, the ends within the budget so that you see where the priorities are. Um, Sue, why don't you jump in here? Okay, so you'll hear a little bit more about the details um, be behind the uh, expense um, changes, but you can see where the, the biggest ones are. Central office, the 300000 that's really the estimate for the um, busing contract. Um, athletics is driven around uniforms, equipment, replacement of equipment, contracted services. Um, building and grounds and utilities, that really is mostly utilities. Um, so that's, that's where you'll see there. And then special education, this again is the out of district placements and transportation. So those are the big drivers. So these are the, the big pieces to your, your um, drivers to just the expense side. But again, going back to looking at the budget as, as a whole, your 80% salary, your 20% um, expense. So as some of these start to rise, you know, su something such as, you know, a $300,000 potential increase in, in transportation, you know, when you're looking at trying to stay within the confines of, a, of an increase, you know, you have to find that money somewhere else. So you're, you're it becomes that battle between money getting pulled out of the classroom to fund things like this. So it, it becomes that battle. And, and I'm just wondering, why do we have a negative on PD? Oh, I'm okay. happy to speak to that. <laughs> <laughs> so at the close of this school year, our math textbook subscriptions for grades 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 expired. And originally we had put into the budget to purchase new books. 
but right now it's November and we were thinking to do a really thorough textbook review and adoption it would take a very long time and what we what we sort of would like to do is to ensure that whatever product we purchase we're using consistently and with fidelity from two to six at the same time grades seven and eight are going to expire in the spring of 2019 so over the next two years we are going to have to replace math textbooks for a great number of grade levels one of the things that has happened is um, my admin assistant, Georgette, um, has managed to call in Vision, which is the company we're currently using, who have been um, willing to come in, make a presentation, and give us a year's use for free. So that's pretty phenomenal, <laughs> right? That's great. Um, free but is always good. Should have been its own I'm slide. What I'm saying yes. <laughs> should have what? Should have been its own, its own slide. slide. <laughs> <laughs> But what I'm saying is that even though it's negative for curriculum professional development because the textbook account is down slightly this year, we can anticipate that next year as we go into purchasing new books for FY20 for grades 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, um, that number is going to be a whole lot higher. But we've got a year's um, reprieve. We've been rolling pretty consistently, I think, in budgets on a subject per year. So I think it was science last year, finally. Yep. Um, so could we are we expect are we are we pushing anything else further down the line by delaying math or are we potentially doubling up next year is there anything else coming down yeah we will have to check on that uh one concern and i think i had mentioned this last year is that we'll have new social studies frameworks mm -hmm. eventually so that may warrant the purchase of additional text but i think in places where um we've had you know, for example, we added an AP Physics course or additional sections. We've been able to come up with 25 textbooks there just out of, you know, piecemealing things together. So I will check to see if there are any other major subscriptions that are running out. Okay, thank you. So one of the things that we thought we would use, do as an example um, is to think about, and, and we're just picking on athletics because it seems like a really concrete example, is to think about what would happen looking at this addition. Now, now under athletics, and you will be hearing from Dee, of course, and we've talked about the increases and why they're there, and we know that this is her second year as a new athletic director and some of the, the challenges that she was faced with and some changes that she needed to make in her first year. Um, but it, it has become, it is our responsibility uh, in presenting the budget to think about, well, are there other, other, any other revenue sources? And so one of the things that we have looked at is athletic fees um, and we're just presenting with you some comparisons uh, that Sue has gathered across other districts to show you where we fall um, and please understand that it's alphabetical in case you're wondering why the organizational structure um, because it also falls squarely in the middle of the slide which is visually appeal appealing um, but so you, you know this is something when we start to look at all of the other opportunities we are incredibly low um, when it comes to athletic fees I have even had people say to me that they they look forward to their children being in middle school because it's so much cheaper than what they have to pay to belong to you know outside leagues having said that I also know how much work has been done by this school committee and previous school committees to decrease fees to greet D oh, I'm looking at Becky Rebecca you were on the school committee when this was something that was really a, made a priority um, bus athletic uh, I think also um, parking 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 and there used to be an activity fee as well at the middle no, school. We never, talked it never about really it. happened. Yeah. We so, had it one year, but it never got collected, and we never had it again. So I understand why it's so low. It's low because the school committee has really worked hard within their budget constraints to lower the fees over time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I put it up here as an example of when we're looking at the challenges that we're facing at, it, at currently 6.9%, 8.9%. We're only beginning, and we know that we have lots of opportunities, and we're looking forward to your thoughts on where that might be. But we have to also be realistic about where we might be able to generate some additional uh, revenues to basically take away that increase mm -hmm. and level fund that line. Not reduce, not take, not level fund, not take away any athletic expenses clearly, but what we've been really 
trying to get at with every conversation that we've had with our departments has been level funding. And when it has been below level funding, great, but if it's been above, that's where we've been focusing um, our conversation. So this seemed to be somewhere where there, there's 108,000 above level by increasing fees just a little bit across all athletes, could that make that increase go away? Be, it would be interesting to come, when we come back to this in a future meeting to know how many athletes we have and what the per, yeah. what the, how much of a difference it would make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to versus see the well, offset of how families that are also paying bus fees and other yeah. parking fees and everything else. Yep. So there's currently 1,432 athletes. There you go. So 1,432 <laughs> athletes means... That was impressive. <laughs> 1,432 athletes is not 1,432 separate individuals, right? Somebody could, who plays more than one sport but shows pay, up you in pay that. for the fee for each I know, but I'm sport. thinking there are some caps up there. So I'm thinking as we think about okay. modeling it, yes. we want to make sure that we're not... If we if we do talk about a fee that we're not just multiplying that times fourteen thirty two because there might be some nuance yep. with it. You, you have to so you do have to be cautious if you were going to do a two sport cap, you know, of that fourteen thirty two. You may have you know three sport athletes if oh, you're doing a family yeah. cap. So there are a lot of different ways of looking at it as as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So yes, I am not a fan of fees, but it is a compelling argument. Um, to think about we're not offering it as a solution um, it just it was an example to of an of. opportunity yep. mm -hmm. yeah I mean, my first reaction is it's it, I mean there's almost nothing off the table at this stage yeah, of right, the budgeting right, process but right. the, I, I feel like this is something we're gonna want we it's at least worth looking at absolutely given that you know you look <clears throat> at the comparison with all the other school districts Yep. The, you make a case here absolutely mm -hmm. I, I will say I will derail us just for a second to say that uh, so I think in my time and Rebecca's time, we started the fees, <laughs> uh, and then we I was started. I when we started them. Were you? Oh, st oh started having we them. No, that wasn't We implemented the fees, and then we started scaling them back because, um, well, when we started the fees, we had parents saying, I would rather pay a fee than have you cut a sport, and mm -hmm. so we took them at their word, um, but then started to get feedback, particularly at town meeting year over year, about how challenging it was for people to pay fees for public education and um, expenses and all that. And so we did make a commitment to reduce fees by 10% every year, which we really faithfully stuck to for a series of years. And so that's why we've gotten them back down so low. So I agree with you, John. Nothing is off the table. This, again, is such a, an unusual and particularly challenging year mm -hmm. with our special education cost that I, I, we can't not consider everything. Right. But um, I just want everybody that wasn't here for that part of the process to be mindful of what the history is, why we were forced to do it in the first place, and why we tried so hard to pull it back after that. And we've done a great job. We no longer have any elementary bus fee. Our parking and transportation fee for the high school and middle school is $110, which is also, I'm sure, the chart would look just like that if yeah, you put that up for does. bus. So, um, and I assume that if we're talking about the athletic fees, we're also going to talk about bus fees. We've um, always kept them the same. Not necessarily. Well, if we're not, maybe that's another. I mean, if, if we're talking about looking at all opportunities, I think we have to look at all opportunities. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, you could argue that athletics is extra and you have to get to school, but you could also argue that all extracurriculars are part of a, mm -hmm. a, a whole child education. So. That's enough of a derailment. Well, but I, just might, I might just add, because you brought up transportation, that it does frame the discussion we had earlier tonight. Yeah. I mean, it does, or a daycare it does, it does bring some reality to that discussion as well um, in terms of what we're able to continue to afford to do. The, the other piece, if we can put bus fees on the table that should be thought of down the road is literally down the road. Uh, the impact on traffic because there are families that, that opt true. not to use the bus because they because the don't want to pay the fee, which increases traffic on the road. Right. Um, and and, and Brian had something. And at the schools, that's true. Uh, yeah, Brian. I just, oh, sorry. Sorry. Just, I would also say just for uh, the, obviously we're comparatively lower, but the comment you made about how you said parents look <laughs> forward to getting to school sports because of the, the highest one on there is still something a parent's going to look forward to. So we're not, we're, we're, we're never going to be competitive price-wise with the outside sports. Right. Did you have a yeah. question, Brian? 
Uh, not so much a question as a comment about fees. I don't have an opinion one way or the other on fees. I'm sure you guys will figure all that out as what's best. Um, but just like hidden fees now growing, I think, too, for athletics, helmets, mm -hmm. concussions. So all of a sudden everybody needs the helmet that's going to really protect, and those helmets are three or $400. And there's encouragement to get those helmets. And so you're paying the fee, and you're buying the helmet, then the football helmet's different than the lacrosse and the hockey helmet and the baseball helmet. And there's, all, there's a lot of other fees out there that parents are absorbing as the kids play that 30 years ago, my helmet was leather strapped inside. So maybe that explains a few things. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's, I think there's other things, there's other expenses growing in the community as we participate. Well, and to your point, point, this doesn't show that everyone yep. is not required, but most people do pay um, a laptop fee. Right. So, did you have a question, Claire? No, I, I just wanted to add. I mean, I know no one wants to see fees go up, but I'm just thinking, putting this in perspective of how many other families, instead of these kind of sports, they either are paying for ballet or karate or gymnastics. Um, my kids did figure skating, and mm -hmm. you don't want to know what that cost, but that 110 was just the ice for probably about eight weeks. Mm -hmm. No lessons, no nothing, just, just one piece of ice. So, you know, relative to other things that families are, are spending for non-school athletics, just mm. there's a sort of perspective thing there. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so what we're looking for um, and hoping for from all of you tonight is um, some direction. Um, obviously, you want it to go down. I get that. Um, but as you know, we have um, I it's central office is our, our next meeting, so we'll be prepared to give a detailed analysis of what's happening around um, technology, special education, and building and grounds. Buildings and grounds mm -hmm. um, at our next meeting. Um, that's where we will be providing in advance to all of you um, the detailed uh, line by line item, itemed. Um, budget for each of those departments and you'll get those in advance of the meeting so tonight was really just an overview but you will get those those that level of detail in advance of the meeting and we'll go through it with you and um, with with a mind of thinking about places where we can be working to make additional reductions um, but are there any overall comments or directions or um, I'll, I'll ask Jean to decide who should yeah, well, we'll let Brian go first because he raised his So the budget advisory group met a couple weeks back. We didn't have the MCAS results yet. Correct. Um, I thought some of the, some of the um, feedback coming out of that meeting was there was concern about the MCAS results. The per pupil price uh, spending was going up. And oh, that's what, that's what yeah. I'm saying. This is okay. what I heard. Yeah, no. And what I saw here tonight is different than that. Yeah. The MCAS results are fantastic. The per, pe uh, per pupil spending is kind of where it's been for many, many years, sort of the middle of the pack yes. in the Commonwealth uh, and in the region. Um, so I don't know what happened at that budget advisory group meeting. I'm not on that committee this go round, um, but we need to make sure we correct that perception or misperception if that's what it was. Hmm. Yeah, I'm. I'm interested to hear that. I'm not sure where that came from because I think I don't sharing the MCAS results at the at the budget advisory group meeting would be very important. Yeah, we uh, didn't have Mike those. was there. Mike, did you have that impression? Well, you didn't have it yet. You said they were coming out tomorrow. But did we, did, did you get the sense that there there was concern about the performance? I do. Yes. I do but think I set the. We uh, weren't sure because I. I you, do you think I. I walked you through the fact that this was like a reset year, so that we weren't going to be able to compare. Uh, we weren't going to have student growth data between this year and last year because That's it. of That's the change. That's where it came from, right there. Yeah, but that but was that created a bit of a buzz that oh my gosh, we're going in the wrong direction. They need all this money. You know, the whole uh, oh oh sorry, yeah, no, it was just kind of kicked so because we didn't know yet, but oh, now we do. No. and allegedly we did quite well. The concern <laughs> that was brought up at that time was that you didn't Not know the results, like and if it was lower than you thought, you'd want to put more money into getting us to where we should be. Oh, I don't remember that's saying that. that okay, if, if you were left with that impression, that's not what we intended to communicate, and clearly that's what you were left with, and and all the more reason to have those meetings I so know. that we can we can keep ourselves. I, I think um, certainly the communication that I provided to the community and provide and shared the 
PowerPoint that had been shared from the commissioner, commissioner's office um, was that communities can expect that MCAS results are going to be different than they've been in the past, but there was never any alarm on our part. In fact, it, w it felt like, if anything, it's going to be a year where the results are not going to be com completely meaningful. Um, and we're be we've been pleased to see that actually there is data there that we can work with both on the high end, the performance data and comparison across the state. We were delighted to see, of course, but also, um, as Dr. Kavanaugh pointed out tonight, specific areas where we know we can target our work. Um, so, yeah, that point math, point four math, coach, very important. Uh, <laughs> that's why for it, that came out of that that analysis, correct? Mm -hmm. So, thank you for that comment question because we need to we that's a, that's one of the most important places for us to clarify understanding because mm -hmm. that's the reason we want to be having these meetings with with the other with the other town depart um, committees right yeah so. absolutely yes yeah. I have one question yeah uh, regarding the pre-k um, the larger enrollment projected for next year typically I recall that that's always been a fixed amount year over year because you have so many slots for it is there a reason for the expected increase? New building. The new school. More Sweet. room. More room. So is it a requirement that you have the capacity that you have to increase? Oh, well, that is a great question. Oh, yeah. So the increased capacity are tuition-based students. We have a requirement to educate any student, preschool student with, with a disability, and then we have a ratio within our classroom spaces that we need to meet. So because we have more room, we can offer more program options, and so the school committee is aware of the fact that we've been changing the numbers of days of instead of uh, everybody comes for the same number of days we have <coughs> half day programs we've got two days a week we have three days a week we are able to change our programming um, and by doing that we can provide more more um, options for community peers and now we have more even more room so the number is a result of increased special special education needs required to meet within the district and there's no cap on that and then meeting that ratio within each classroom so that um, that there is a, there's a compare there's a peer a peer group within each classroom for students with disabilities is the model that we're after but all of the non special education students are tuition based and they all pay tuition to attend so it actually increases our reven revenue around so, the preschool so the program budget does reflect the increased revenue uh, from the I'm assuming so be the, an the, the, the projections for the offsets are based on, you know, projected revenue, but I'm also truing up so that we're um, creating a sustainable model so that what I'm appropriating as an offset matches the revenue that's coming in. So I think we haven't done this for a few years, but especially because we're new, moving into a beautiful new building and the preschool actually will be with the kindergarten and first grade for the first time in... I, certainly this century I don't know when was the last time but um, <laughs> I think we should make sure that the that our tuition rates are competitive with other private preschool rates in so town. so we asked that question as well okay and two years ago I believe um, was it only that long ago yeah okay. so you did a market analysis and you did adjust your preschool tuition rates okay so I would say right now they are to market okay yeah. I think what will be interesting maybe as we get to um, I was gonna say the center school budget but the marathon school I budget know, presentation really um, is if we could get a, a breakout of <clears throat> what I sort of clumsily refer to as new building costs like, what, what are the what are the things that are hitting our budget this year mm -hmm directly as a result of moving into the new building. Mm -hmm. So you talked about the elec the utility piece and the electricity. I know that's not in Lauren's budget, but if we could pull those things out just so that we could show mm -hmm. kind of what that, I think what that that is. I don't think that the, I'm not sort of worried about the response to it, but I think from a transparency perspective, it's a good we thing. We can do that. Did you have to do an operational when you submitted for the MSBA? We did. Okay. Yeah, we did. So like that's where that's where that's where Susan got that utility number. Right. So I think a lot of that could could be pulled from there. But I'm also thinking about, I mean, a lot of the the physical uh, furniture and equipment is in the project budget. But then there are probably some. I, I mean, I'm just speculating. There are probably some additional budget items for things that teachers might 
need when they move into the larger spaces that might not have been in the project. But so anything like that, I think, would be would be worthwhile to just have broken out as a separate exhibit. Well, in addition to that, I think we need to know the old school budget um, number two. If if there are, we have had this question before. I think from the um, center school reuse committee, is there are there things that are not going to be moved, and is there a cost associated mm -hmm. with disposal of those? And do does the school bear that cost? Does the town bear that cost? Is it I don't how is so that, that the project those, budget? Those, I don't those know. are all project costs. That's in the project. Yep. So that's so, in the project budget mm -hmm. already. That is. Yes. But what so, I, w I would like to add, yeah. if I may, Jean, is that because you, you raised the question of the comparison, um, we were able to reduce two building-based uh, building requests for furniture by having our jo joint meeting with all of the principals where both Anne and Vanessa said, oh, well, we can take furniture from Lauren. So that's the kind of thing that the collaboration and looking Great. at all of our resources, because Lauren, because the Marathon School will come fully furnished and is part of the project, um, and she's actually not permitted to move any of the furniture. They don't want to miss mosh of furniture at that building. There is furniture in good condition that when principals came and said, well, under my um, expense budget, I need this furniture, the conversation that we had was, well, is there anything at the, that the current center school that is in good enough condition and is appropriate size-wise for students in the other buildings? And there was a reduction that we were able to make as part of that process. So we are, we're thinking right. of all of those things as we go through opportunities for redistribution as well of, of furniture into other buildings. There's, there's a, the, kidney-shaped tables are very popular amongst <laughs> elementary teachers. So there's, and you know, Jen. So there's a bit of a like a tug of war for who gets the kidney get the kidney table from the center school. Is there a market to like sell any of the stuff that our district doesn't want? Textbook, but we don't from have that building. I'm not sure about that. So the yeah. um, you, you mean the like furniture? furniture? Like yeah. So that's actually part of we started talking about that at the um, the ESBC meeting okay. the other night. So the, this is part of the disposition of it will be part of the project and the, the project management team compass is helping us with that. So so put it on the house get revenue on the yeah, that's basically yeah, what we're doing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so do, do we have any other requests or comments directional? I just see what the, the dollar increases are, both the, the 6.9 and the 8.9. <coughs> yeah. 3.8. So I can send, send you the, um, the PowerPoint. Actually, yeah. yeah. No problem. So I would also, um, you know, going forward, I would love to see, I know it's already included in what you've done, but just highlight it out if there are any new initiatives that are resulting in savings um, that are offset. I mean, I see the, the bottom line numbers, but, yeah. and we've seen a lot of what the additions are or the things that we, that are non-negotiable. But just, you know, I, you've talked so much about what you took away, the outs, um, just mm -hmm. to just to get a better window into what those are. Um, I know we started a conversation in particular around food service and if that's going forward and what that impact yes. is. Um, so things like that I think would be really helpful. So you'll get that level of detail now going As forward. As we go for forward. Every, I mean, that would be something we'll talk about under um, central office. The central office budget would include the food service. Well, food service is really, it's a revolving account. So it's, right now it's not funding your operational, but that food service revolving account is being depleted. Mm -hmm. So by changing the model of our food service, you're going to create that so it becomes a sustainable revolving account so that the repairs and things, hopefully down the line, once we start to save that account, then the repairs to the, and things that need to be done within the kitchen can be done out of that account as opposed to out of the operating account. Okay. But as far as um, as articulating and demonstrating for the school committee all of the changes throughout the budget process and the details, that will come now moving forward with each mm -hmm. detailed budget that we take up. Okay. Um, so it felt like we didn't kind of know how to get at that other than to give an overview tonight and then... <coughs> break it apart department by department. And then we tried doing it the opposite way one year and that didn't work. 
All right, any other questions, comments, anything? So John? just for the f future summary, the summary budgets uh, as we're working our way through this. So we had in the initial meeting, joint meeting, we had talked about the 3.5. And so um, I, I just, it, it's like about 1.5 1. 1. million would be a 3.5% increase. So I just wonder if we could keep that sort of up on this, so we kind of have a sense of the gap to target. Okay. Um, you know whether or not. It's a good idea. Whether or not like so, a running record. Yeah, just so we can keep having that conversation, so we can also, so uh, everybody around this table right now can kind of see what are, what is that gap at, from a dollar perspective, and then as we look at those expense line items specifically, what is that gonna, what is that actually gonna mean towards that? Yeah, I get it. All right. Anybody else? Before we move on, are you ready? All right, so Thank you. our first item under new business actually is our FY19 capital improvement plan. So if you all are comfortable in your chairs, you might want to stay for this. And do we have extra copies of the memo and the and last year's spreadsheet that we can pass down there? Yes. Thank you. You gave them back to me, Jean, didn't you? Did I? I think. I sent them the, my memo. I gave them my memo. So I think they've got Oh, here's some work. extra oh, okay. memos. Okay. okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. So, um, Dr. McLeod or, or Ms. Rotherman, whichever one of you, do you want to get us started here? It's 100000 Sure. Um, so, as I brought to you um, previously the um, capital plan. So the items that are under consideration are the turf field project, this is field four and five, and as a reminder, um, 2.7 million of that uh, request was put in under a CPC grant. Um, so the total cost for the estimate for the turf field was 3,886,865. A dishwasher for the cafeterias, um, this is a beginning of a process of Putting, the cap putting dishwashers back into the um, cafeterias. The middle school had one when it um, um, went out of service. It just was not replaced. Um, and we began, began that process with putting a dishwasher in the marathon school. Mm. The next one is looking at our campus, the middle school, high school, and Hopkins campus, and putting together a master plan, which is something that you've approved we'll be doing the creating that master plan this year, and that would be looking at bus parking, the traffic flow, um, maintenance, storage, um, all different items. So this would be looking at different uh, recommendations of that master plan, and this could be, the uh, this is a placeholder for doing stage one or part of whatever that master plan recommendation is. HVAC replacements um, district-wide. We had an HVAC company go through the district and identify many of the elements that were not working. Um, most of these are univents. We have a large um, uh, unit also at the Elmwood School. So these are various units throughout the entire district where um, replacing would bring your air quality um, efficiency of running those units. Um, we found in one school you have a unit that's um, both heating and cooling at the same time, so different things like that. Uh, Walk-in refrigerator and freezers, these are the condensing units. Again, we brought in a company to go through all of our refrigeration. A lot of these units are the same age as the building, so the, it's original equipment that continues to go down. We've had um, food loss. Um, as a result of several of these. Um, the air conditioning at the middle school auditorium, this is uh, because we use the middle school auditorium, it's a community asset, it's held for town meeting. This is an article that was on previously and was not funded um, to the level that matched the engineering study. So this is bringing it back to get the level of funding that would be necessary for that. The security, the technology, the security upgrades, these are cameras for the middle school, high school, both interior, exterior, and the loop road, which would include the doghouse and um, various aspects of the fields. The other technology um, upgrades 
are your what's called the MDF closets. Um, and Ashoka is here to the core switches. Um, so that would be kind of that first phase of starting to get at really the infrastructure for your technology. The last one is a outstanding order of conditions. And again, this is a placeholder. This was a um, conservation wetlands uh, order of conditions actually from 1995, I believe. This is something that will need to be addressed. We have right now put the <coughs> funding to do the engineering in next year's budget, um, but we're looking to see if there's any possibility of finding funding this year so that we could come up with an, a real estimate of what that would be so that we could move this project along. So this is a placeholder. Um, so it could include the engineering, um, so that this is kind of a, a guess at a number, not a solid number at this time. I have a few questions, if mm -hmm. I may. Yep. Um, so on the turf field, besides the CPC amount, I thought there was something that we were looking to raise through corporate sponsorships. Is that rolled into the 2.7 number? No, the 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 3.886 that is, there may be some things in there that we might be able to get some 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 of like the equipment that's included with it we might be able to get some sponsorships that would reduce the borrowing amount that we would have but none of that would none of the 2.7 cpc is potential sponsorship offset so the 3.886 could put, i mean could potentially come down a little bit with corporate sponsorships but i don't think we're, we're not talking i mean order of magnitude it's not it's not going to significantly reduce the cost of the project i think the yeah i think the greater opportunity for corporate sponsorships is probably in the phase two yeah. um, area, which is not to say that, I mean, John and, and another subcommittee member are working on that, but, um, but the short answer, it's too late to give, the short answer to your question is, this is the total project number. Right. We don't yet know what CPC will contribute, um, and we haven't gone out to bid for the final number. So this is the estimate that we've been given by Gale Associates, and that's the full amount for right now. So the borrowing, then, if I'm understanding, would be the, the 3.8 minus whatever CPC gives us. Well, I'm going to look right? at Mr. Herr because I don't know. So sometimes CPC, it's not like they're going to write us a check. Sometimes they pay the cert debt service. Okay. So, And I don't know if... That means that the warrant article is written for the entire project budget, and it says in there that C because we have to also vote the CPC money at town meeting. So my guess is, my uneducated guess is that the warrant article is going to be for the total amount of the project, but that's a borrowing, not a transfer of money, and that if CPC, whatever CPC approves and the town meeting approves, that will come out of that. It, that much less will be borrowed, and if we raise corporate sponsorship, that much less would be borrowed. Is that the correct? So the article will speak to the total amount of the project, $3.8 million, just for conversation's sake tonight. Um, the motion will then, inside the article, will spell out how that $3.8 million is going to be covered and whether or not the CPC is going to bond it or they're going to just write a check. Uh, my, I, don't, I don't know where their head is on that, um, and in that, but the article is at 3.8, and then you work down from there in the motion itself. Right. Right? So it's like an MSBA article. Basically, you have the yeah. total the total project yeah. amount. We're on the hook. Sub. We're all yeah. in for the 3.8. Right. How we'll pay for it is what we chip away at, and we spell out in the motion, um, and all that has to happen as part of the process, or then, you know, you can't proceed. But we don't have where, those answers. But where's this right 2.7? Now? I don't understand this 2.7. That, that was our request. That was our grant request to CPC. So that's okay. everything but the carpet, basically. In the application, that was everything. Exactly. I and so I know we had this question earlier, but the where that stands is that town council is reviewing the breakdown project breakdown that we submitted to determine. We already know they can't pay for the carpet. We didn't ask for that in the grant request. But there may be other things in the breakdown project breakdown that. CPC funding cannot be used for. So they basically are waiting for town council to tell them what portion of that list they can consider. And then we will go back and have a further conversation with them, hopefully on November 21st. That's the date that of their next meeting, and they're hoping that they'll hear back from town council 
um, by that point. We actually have our top of the hill um, inauguration that night, so I asked if we could go late, be last on their agenda, um, and I think we could do both. But So that's sort of where that stands. But the short, and again, way too late to give the short answer, but the short answer is we have to put this entire number there for right now. I see. And um, just to follow up, uh, in, I think, John, you were talking about the corporate sponsorship or raising private funds to be not a substantial amount. Is, is that right? So, I mean, I, so I, I shouldn't say it's not a substantial amount, but it's not – I don't think it's going to uh, – there's nothing that's going to reduce it by, you know, multiple hundred thousand dollars. I mean, the bulk of that 3.86 is in, is the construction of the field structure itself and then the, the carpet. So – um, so it does include some equipment that may be able to be raised by corporate sponsorship, but again, I don't think it, it's going to—it's not going to have a market impact on that. Um, the other question I have is on the dishwasher, and it's my understanding that you had considered Mr. Manning's suggestion from last time about the cardboard or you know green plates. Can you speak a little bit to that, please? Um, so currently, and we, we discussed this when we had the discussion with the um, marathon building uh, committee. So the cost for a green plate is, or trays, if you will, it is double the cost of, of a styrofoam tray. So you're not going to necessarily completely prove money one way or another, you know, so you, you – <coughs> double the cost of the tray, you're still putting, so I looked up m the middle school in particular, so these are 47,000 trays that you're putting in, so, you know, it's, you, you can do the green tray, it's still 47,000 trays, it's still going into the trash cycle, or the trash stream, you know, now it's green as opposed to styrofoam, so, you know, it's just all the things that you have to, as a committee, decide the direction that you would like your cafeterias to be going. So is this primarily an environmental, um, you know, there's an environmental reason behind this or there's a cost savings reason behind? You, you won't really drive your, your cost, you know, really one way or another. If you look out on the internet, you know, they, they all point in both directions. So you're, you're reducing your cost for, for trash, which is actually carried mm -hmm. on, on the town side. Mm -hmm. Um, you're reducing uh, water, you know, while you're, in, you, you're thinking you're increasing water, they're, they're high efficiency machines, you know, so it just, it goes back and forth. Yes, you have to hire a dishwasher, you know, you have less of your uh, custodian emptying cr trash. So they continue to balance out. Okay. Including the ongoing maintenance of something like that. A dishwasher? Right. Um, it's really kind of a low you know, not, it's not a high maintenance thing. Okay. So you, you run the D lime, if you will, you run a D lime through, you know, you have calcium things in, in your water. You run the D lime through the, through the machine, um, once a week or whatever it is. So it's, it's not a huge maintenance thing. I see. I think for me, my main consideration on the dishwasher is it feels like we're making a decision are we are we committing ourselves by doing I mean I understand we're doing it in the context of a new building and that's sort of one thing but by starting to retrofit the the other four existing schools and starting with the cheapest one probably right are we committing right now at least um, philosophically to a series of expenses down the road that we don't yet know because we don't know um, <laughs> I don't know why <laughs> Sorry, because uh, we don't yet know what those costs are going to be at the other schools. Um, so that's really my only hesitation about that. And is and I mean, is there anything related to the potential switch of the food service providing method that we provide food service? Is there anything related to that that's contingent on doing the dishwasher this year, or could we take a look a, a look at you know, can we make a plan for addressing all four buildings and see the full scope of it before we take step one, I guess is kind of my question. Well, this one's the easiest because right. the dishwasher did exist. So you're really just getting a dishwasher and, and putting it back in place where it existed. 
the other kitchens are more complicated, which is why you don't see that here. Right. Because you could be potentially looking at a full redesign. It may not be cost effective. So, you know, this is one where, you know, in when the dishwasher failed, my recommendation would have been to replace the dishwasher. Mm -hmm. For whatever reason, we did not replace the dishwasher and went with the way of, you know, styrofoam trays. But, you know, this one is the easiest. Okay. It's not to say that you will do the remaining ones because you may say that it's just not cost effective. Okay. All right, thank so you. So we can make so we're making these decisions by individual building. We don't Absolutely. need to have there's not this isn't a, a first step towards an entirely change model. No. Because okay. the, like I said, this one's easy. You had a dishwasher, this is putting one back in. Okay. I have uh, one last question. On the stage one campus road master plan, I recall uh, last time when we met, you said we are in the phase where we are um, asking for seeking bids. So how confident are you of this projection of 320000 So this number is a placeholder. Um, this number is actually the estimate that we receive to pave field nine. So if that was what this cap, um, master plan said was still a good idea, this would be a piece in, in addressing that. So keep in mind, we're looking at everything um, when you're looking at the, the, the master plan, if you will. You know, where does parking make the most <laughs> sense? Where, you know, and that includes students, staff, where would you put a bus parking lot? Um, if the turf fields go through, do you have sufficient parking for events? So now Park and Rec and, you know, looks to um, increase the use of those fields. Where does it make the most sense for the parking for those events? And then you have the whole traffic flow. You know, so we did what we did this year to get everybody onto campus for both, um, you know, morning and afternoon drop-off. Is it the best solution? It may not be. You know, so this is just a placeholder, and we use the number of paving field nine as, as the placeholder. So if I understand from the motion here, we're, we're looking to endorse this mm -hmm. and move it on, and this is our crack at mm -hmm. making changes as we, or not as we. Mm -hmm. so well, not, necess not necessarily. I mean, we, uh, I guess we have in past, I mean, from past <laughs> precedent, um, we rarely add from here, and I think by the time we get to the end off. of December, we really can't add. But we typically, I, I would say most years, the, the list we submit preliminarily, we've usually removed one or two things just because the need changes or we make decisions right. last as the year budget we goes on. Right, the air conditioning. Well, yes. We removed yeah. the turf fields last, yeah. last year. Yes. And additionally, as we get more information, we can true up these numbers as we start to move towards town meeting. So th yeah. this isn't like this is our final set in stone capital articles that we we're putting forward, but no, it more is, <laughs> to, meet, to meet the deadline. Yeah. Yeah. So in the, in the context, you know, again, you know, we're we're one department. So all departments are doing the same right. exercise. So everything is due to the town tomorrow, and they'll be consolidating all department requests. Yeah. So, so this is also preliminary based on what you're saying. Uh, I mean, I guess it depends on your definition of preliminary. But I mean, we're sub <laughs> we're submitting it well, to the town okay. to say at this point in time, this is what we expect to be our asks. And this is the most complete information that we have. Yeah. Um, go ahead. I, so from that standpoint, I don't know how many changes I, I would, would want to make to that. I do have some concerns about the dishwasher. I actually think it's a great idea in philosophically looking at it from a green standpoint. I do wonder down the road if, if this is going to be the best year for it, just based on some of the information we have from the town. Well, I think so. In so the I, air conditioning as well. So uh, the, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but uh, this is a thought on the dishwasher. I mean, I, th I feel like uh, my I, I agree with you, and kind of where I am is so let's put it on there, Keep it on for now. and then when we get to the discussions around the the budget that includes dining services and what that's going to mean right. for potentially bringing it in house, it, it, if that plays into the dis, I would yes. at that point we that would have the discussion. Um, again, we can always take it off. Yeah, right. So. I would agree with that. So sometimes we also <clears throat> sort of prioritize what we think our pri is that is there an appetite to not necessarily do uh, however many like one through ten lists, but 
he, he, these are our primary, you know, these are our top. Should we wait and do that after we find out what, you know, after all of the departments have submitted and we kind of get more of a ballpark feel? Yeah, we can I mean, if that. this is what you've come up with as far as, like, would be really nice to have, let's, I mean, it doesn't hurt to ask for it, and then right. when it when it comes back, you need to cut. Right. <laughs> we'll say, all right, we'll cut. Then we'll decide at that point. I, I'd also suggest that that initially come from um, Kathy and Susan in terms of, like, what's, Right. What's operationally critical? Right. Versus exactly. what yeah. are well, nice things that we exactly. that we think would be this would be a good year to do yes. it. So maybe it's not right. necessarily stack ranking them, but just those categorizing mm -hmm. them that way. Yeah. So you had asked me to ask around the safety um, upgrade, mm -hmm. security cameras. Um, when we talked about sponsored. when we talked about this at the last meeting. Um, school committee to ask that we look into whether or not that would be jointly sponsored given that it was looking at security on the loop road on areas that are used extensively by the town as well um, and Sue did have a chance to check in. Yeah, so I, I had a conversation um, with the um, resource officer who also spoke with chief and both are fully in support and and would, in, okay. it would endorse this as, okay. as a jointly sponsored um, you know, both because this is, you know, you have the school hours, but there's a significant amount of time that are non-school hours, and it's it's pub, you know, it's you know, public property, um, so it, it it is a town-wide uh, concern, if you will. Mm -hmm. So yes, they're, so they're they'll in full submit support. It, they'll submit it as well, and it'll be. Is that how that works? Then it ends up being jointly sponsored. I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, if the Police Department off, uh, also submits a request to Capital around something that is a, also security upgrades. Would it be considered then one article that's jointly sponsored by two I departments? So, sure. but I think can we? Is there a space in the form you have to fill out that says it's like P.S. This is a <laughs> <laughs> joint project, or it, has it, it, it actually? It actually does not. Does have, it have a P.S. section? There's no P.S. section. Oh. Um, well, I can certainly it. add that to the to the verbiage. to the narrative. Yeah, okay. yeah. we can I figure think, that out long yeah. before we set the yeah. Word yeah. Out, okay. So. We just felt like, from a messaging standpoint, you know, there's been a lot of talk, obviously, and concern around vandalism, and it's all happened off school hours. Obviously, we have great grounds, and and the public uses them extensively, um, and you know, I think that this is. A, a need that the police have at least as much as as the schools and and mm -hmm. will be helpful to them my one question uh, somebody in the community asked me this and I thought it was a good one I assume that with modern technology <clears throat> it's not a problem that some of our parking lots on the loop road are not lit the loop road is lit has lights but HJ and K lot have no lights within the lot so do the security cameras work in the dark so there's different low light okay. um, settings or cameras that you can put in different places because not every, um, sometimes from a um, police standpoint, they actually don't want the light. Right. So, but you can still have cameras that, that will pick up okay. even with I mean, I figured, but, no but part of the bus <coughs> campus road master plan would also be looking at potential and lighting, lighting as okay. well. So maybe together we'd have more lighting. How about that? Yeah. All right. Does anybody, do <clears throat> any of the four of you have questions or suggestions for us to consider before we vote? No? Okay. Um, is, is there anything that anybody wants to advocate for taking off this list, or are we satisfied with this list? And we will continue to um, obviously tighten up the numbers and communicate with our town partners. So I think because of the silence I believe that I am ready I, I'm ready to hear a motion to approve the submittal of the FY19 capital improvement plan in the in the amount of five million seventy five thousand three hundred and sixty five dollars so moved and a second second okay so that's a motion by Mr. Graziano a second by Ms. Barrett all in favor yes. Yes. yes any opposed or abstained so that's unanimous and that um, 
passes and Susan you will submit all this tomorrow mm -hmm. okay very good thank you very thank much you. and um, you all are more than welcome to stay and listen to our policy we've got some really exciting <laughs> stuff left <laughs> yeah <laughs> Have a good night. not going to want to miss it all right but really thank you very much for being here I know this was a tremendously long meeting and night but um, but being able to hear your feedback as we go through the process is really helpful so thank Absolutely. you thank I, you. I really do appreciate it thank, thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. We're glad you get into the weeds. That means you're pinching every penny. That's we uh, try. We, 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 we recognize do. we have a lot of pennies to pinch. So. Thank, you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Good night. Good night. All right, so we are cruising right along to um, new business C, school committee procedure EEAE1 bus safety. Dr. McLeod. So you now have the document that you didn't have last last meeting where, um, and it has been shared in your packet, EEA1 is a procedural reference or has been a resulting procedural reference um, from combining what was formerly considered policy EEAE, which was bus safety, and policy EEAE, -E -E, <laughs> bus accidents. Sorry. Too late to be doing this yes, again. I, I need some more. <laughs> um, into one procedural reference, um, and I worked with um, Susan Rothermick and Marianne Fitzpatrick to go through and make sure that there was, Marianne did the bulk of, of the work on, on aligning it and making sure that it was in, in line with our pr procedural practices. Um, Sue and I sat with her to look at, just to have some additional eyes on um, <clears throat> making sure that there, there was nothing left out. And I can assure you that the remaining document um, has, has re represents both of the former uh, policies and um, is being recommended that the school committee consider moving to combine the two. As procedural references, that would be uh, reference under transportation EEA. So what we really would be doing is adding these to reducing two former policies into procedure and attaching them to the transportation policy. And I don't blame you for having some confusion. I'm just thinking through the, Mr. no, President. I get it. I'm actually just thinking through the mechanics of okay. it. Right? Okay, oh, I see. Like we have to, I don't know what the word is. We see basically have to decertify two policies. Oh. And then do we even adopt procedure? Well, what if we cleverly drafted a motion to um, trans that transition is not the correct word, but just morph there these policies from policy into procedure. Or well, the motion does suggest that you would move to combine the former policy. We could add the word former. Into one procedural reference. It I think does. That, that was masterfully written. <laughs> I mean, honestly, there is one thing. At, at 1020, I'll go with it. Yeah. <laughs> one word change that I, because we have been doing this on the other policies, the first paragraph, the last sentence instructing children. Oh, Am I right? We're changing that so to students. Mm -hmm. yes. Coherent nice thought. job. I didn't oh, don't even stop. see that. No, we have That's my favorite. Um, okay. In my head, I have a whole song going about E E A E E. So and don't <laughs> share. Yeah. <laughs> That's for after the cameras turn up. Okay. Um, so I, I have one related question. You know, talking about the safety of the children, it's my understanding, Dr. McLeod shared, that it's only when children are in kindergarten that it's required that an adult be present yeah. when the kids get off the bus. Should yeah. we be looking to, you know, raise the bar a little bit beyond in covering at least the Elmwood kids also? Um, is that... No. <laughs> I, know. I, I would say my daughter is perfectly capable of getting off the bus. I love the fact that I have to leave the house to get the kids off the bus. But when she last year, she would have yeah. been too. Yeah. But that's not true of all children, though, sure. right? And I think that's the safety concern that we are talking about. If someone gets on the wrong bus and they get off and there's no adult and they walk in and the door is locked. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the safety concern. So, but are we determining the appropriate age for when that exactly. becomes? Right, that's what that's I'm worried the, about too. That's, but, but, but we have. have. But we all have. school, I, don't, I think we can yeah, mostly agree that those students should not be staying. I don't know yeah. the yeah. ones for tonight. Well, I just, yeah. Okay. You don't want so to go 
Could I ask you where? I'm, I'm just trying to locate where in the procedure. I, I do it's not, not in see there. that. Okay. I don't think it's in policy. The other you policy. You think it's under policy, and it's a very good question. Yeah, but um, in the context of the bus transportation policy. Exactly. Yeah, not Which we will be taking up policy. again. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. At least, Probably one, November at least one more time. I think it's a really good question for us to, 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 to consider. Um, it's just that within this particular document, we're not actually calling out the ages. Okay. Because I felt that that was the procedure, and that's where my question came to you, yeah. that what's the cutoff, and you said kindergarten. It, it is true. In the current yeah. policy, it is true. It it's is in, kindergarten. Yeah, it's in the transportation okay. policy. Okay. All right. Any other Which questions? Raise some concerns. I would agree with you. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, so are we, I know this was our first reading, but this went out. It, this went out. And we got no comments. Correct. And this is really just a reflection of what we're actually doing. We're not taking it's anything updated. away. Right. right. Yep. Okay, so are we ready to make a motion to combine policies EEAE and EEAEE -E 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 to create procedure reference EEA-1? Yes. So yes. moved. Okay, and a second? I'll second it. Okay, so a motion by Ms. Kavanaugh, second by Ms. Devlin. All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed or abstained? Okay, so that's unanimous. Thank you very much. And now we will not be able to have fun talking about those letters at any future meeting. But the follow and but the, the operational follow up is like Megan will get them off the website. Yes, she will. Okay. And she will she, also. She's probably doing it right, right now. now. Yeah. <laughs> She will also make sure that it's referenced under EEA, which we will be Perfect. bringing up on either the 16th or the 30th, or the 30th. to be determined. Exactly. Stay tuned. By Ms. Birchman. One of these cliffhangers. Yes. Uh, That's why may, people may watch I our show. passing on of that bowl, please? Oh. Oh, oh that is. And thank you for bringing critical. it. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, it was like. Um, <laughs> is there any chocolate? There's one there chocolate left. Good. All right. <laughs> so. <laughs> thank you. It's nothing here. Policy KCD gifts to the schools or the school district. This is also our first reading, Dr. McLeod. Yes, so we're, we're considering KCD 1, which is the procedural reference outlining gift funding procedures for classroom teachers. Um, and it's referenced, you can see it referenced. So this policy, gifts to the schools or the school district, um, is something that clearly has been in place for a very long time. Um, it, was, it was taken up and amended in 2006, um, but recent fundraising efforts were brought to our attention. We, we have given you the background at, at previous meetings, so I won't go into it in detail unless you have questions, that resulted in this form um, that Dr. Kavanaugh worked with the principals on. It's been, um, and so every, we, are, we are recommending it. We like the form. We think that it will meet our needs. Um, it asks teachers to think about what it is that they may need, um, what the potential funding source would be, the educational purpose. You can see the form that's in front of you. But it also brings levels of scrutiny, um, as you've asked us to do under field trip policy, for example. You don't want a field trip being brought to you for your recommendation or for your approval without some level of scrutiny at the school. So this would first come um, to the building principal who would be able to have that conversation with the teacher. Um, it would then go to the business manager and the purpose of that would be to make sure that it was meeting fire code standards, things that whether it was going to create maintenance issues, an example that we've had in the past for example is, is a class donating a, a lovely garden. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then the lovely garden grows weeds, and then somebody has to maintain it. So just examples of things that would, would need to be, there, there would have to be additional funds to maintain that gift. Um, and then to me, before it would finally come to you. So many levels, um, because it really is, then you would be approving it as a gift. Um, there are so many people in our community that are so willing to help and make donations and provide re uh, resources for classrooms. And it's really just a way of making sure that we are following procedure and that the school committee is accepting the gift, that the gift is going to the classroom um, and is not something that is something that's being brought, you know, to a classroom that leaves when the teacher leaves. Um, these are resources that, that, not that they would be doing that at all. But um, I, I guess an, a very clear example and Dr. Kavanaugh, I'll ask you to help me. 
with the example of the GoFundMe um, page that was brought to our attention back in the summer for, whoops, what were they looking for? Resources. I think in one situation they had received almost like an entire library, and because it was GoFundMe, there were people who were in Texas donating, you know, I mean, just all over the country. Um, but I think one that we had a real issue with, um, a, a classroom wanted um, those sort of elevated chairs and tables, and so kids can kind of sit, Standing, dangle yes. their feet, yeah, yeah. stand if they want to, which is a wonderful thing for kids to be able to do, to be able to stand and work, dangle your feet and work, do those kinds of things, because it keeps you sort of moving even while your brain's moving. Great. But what happened was that set up an equity problem, because if Susan's classroom had 24 of those and mine didn't, my kids were, you know, sort of maybe at a deficit or something as opposed to yours who had an advantage over mine. So that became a concern about equity, mm. I think. And, and I think for us it was just over the summer. Lots of people were putting mm. lots of things out there and they were getting wonderful gifts, but they were enormous. Mm. And we also had some issues with, well, what do you do in terms of storage? Mm. We're running out of storage room because we had a room that had 44 fans. You know, I mean, it was just oh. like those kinds of things. So. So that's why it's here. Um, it's not meant to curb donations. It's really meant to control and understand and have a level of a level of scrutiny around making sure that um, that we're also not putting our our teachers are not putting themselves in a situation where it could be a conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. And so it's it, that that they would never intentionally do. Any questions or comments? I fully support this. Um, I, you know, while we do want as many resources as we can provide to our teachers, but I think you were talking about how the principals get together. That you know, here we have all this excess furniture from center school. So instead of thinking, "Oh, I don't have it, let me go fund it," something like this allows you that rigor to first look at resources that we have, maximize that, and you're not stopping it. You're just putting that procedure in place and. If it can't be done through the school budget or what have you, then. Hmm. How does this connect to HPTA mid-year requests and HEF grants? Mm -hmm. So great question. Around, I'll start with HEF probably. So HEF grants, um, as we all know, teachers need to, they need to submit the request and they have to fill out the, um, the grant proposal. And I think, and then they, there's no guarantee that it's going to be chosen. So this can be a way of kind of circumventing that in a particular classroom, um, which may or may not. So it's kind of a way of an insurance policy, I guess. If I can try to fill out the HEF grant, and then if it doesn't meet their criteria and I don't get it, then I could come and fill out this and see if I can get funding in addition within my classroom. So, and this may just be a language cleanup thing, yeah. but if I read the top line of this form, it says from funding sources that are outside of the HPS budget. Yep. So to me, if I'm if I'm going for a HEF grant, I have to fill this out. Oh, that's not the intent. Okay. No. Um, but we could certainly add language. Outside the HPS budget and other funding. Approved funding. Bodies. Yeah, because then you're right, John. Now you're talking about music association, yeah. boosters, PTA, HEF. I'm sure there are more that I'm too tired to but think But even of. for all of that, don't we already have some procedures and forms in place? Yeah, and we, we do. do. I think J stuff. John's question is a little bit different. I mean, we're certainly not yeah, in I just any think way trying to take away from those those, those organizations and their decision making. We're, yeah, we're not trying it, to add a step. Or, or to replace. Right. No. Right. I just, I think the way it's mm -hmm. written yep. mm -hmm. would require this form to be filled out before they did any of those things. Okay, so let's change it then. Yeah, how about adding something to the effect of that are outside the HPS budget and other approved funding sources or something of that to tweak? Are they an approved funding source? Or? Well, because they've had to be approved to get an F, a HEF grant. There's already been that level of yeah. scrutiny. Maybe there's a better word for it. But. Yeah, yeah. Well, it could it, it could actually I mean it would create a little bit more work initially, but that actually the approved funding sources could be a nice way to do it because I I don't know if there is a consolidated list of all those things we just rattled off when teachers think about if they have a request or a need where to go. You know, I know I'm, I know sometimes the HPTA is even struggling for mid year requests, so 
you know, if you say app approved sources and then here are approved sources. Yeah, yeah. Right? And so that just, again, it gives teachers that resource to say, yep. here are all of the right. places I could go even before I get to a GoFundMe. Yeah, that's really, that, that's a really good point because often the requests are coming from new teachers mm -hmm. who, don't, um, who may not though. be aware yeah. right. that they can go and do those things. And part of the, um, you know, the reasoning behind this was because it it, it was people doing making maybe going off on their own and doing that without realizing that there there was a procedure that the school committee has in place for receiving gifts. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe adding a whole additional sentence that lists what those what those organizations are um, would be useful in here. Um, and I would suggest that we say including but not limited to, just in case we miss one or there's a new yes. group that comes on the scene. Uh, Dr. McLeod, I'm also curious that when you come up with a form like this, when you have seen those instances, were you, did you get any feedback from the teachers? And I'm curious. Um, Dr. Kavanaugh did. I'm sorry. And no, you're no, curious. No, did I cut hear, you off? Uh, the feedback that you may have received from teachers. No, I think when we sent it in the summertime, their immediate concern was what happens if I have a GoFundMe page working right now? Mm -hmm. And we had said, if you have anything in, in place <coughs> right now, you can continue with it. We don't want you to discontinue and be sending money back to Texas. Um, <laughs> but uh, we just said to them, going forward, you just need to put this on hold until we have a policy in place. Right? Because it was just sort of rampant. You sure. Know. And, and, and they, were, they didn't have any concerns? I don't think that anyone, okay. I mean, at least it didn't come back to me that they were upset about it. I think most of the building principals could explain to all of sure. the teachers right. why we were doing what we were doing. I mean, I can certainly see the point, but I'm just wondering if there's a perspective uh, that a teacher may have. I think we need to add all of the organizations. I'm sorry. No, sorry. no, no. I was just looking towards the teacher. Was that a pause? <laughs> no, <laughs> I was you. just looking towards the teacher. Do we need to add them? I mean, maybe we do need to add them all here, or does it, I don't want to add an extra document, but if we had a separate list that we referenced, we, is this a document that we have to vote, and then if we change it, we would have to vote? to change it, if we just had a separate list that was kind of a fluid list of, you know, if a new organization entered the approved list or if somebody mm -hmm. exited the approved list. This is, is a procedure, so we don't have to we vote have to on vote it all on. the time. All right, but so maybe the list should go on here. And we I mean, we can say including but not limited to and then yeah. say the major ones. Well, I, I would say given, given the fact that it is a procedure and we don't have to vote it again, <clears throat> whatever you all think is the easiest way to administer this, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. go for it. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm thinking about adding language such as and, so funding sources that are outside the HPS budget and additional funding sources such as HPTA, HEF, and other parent, and then I, then I, I got think stopped. I often call them school support organizations. Ooh, yeah, that's right. oh, that's cool. Cool. Additional yeah. funding. That's just kind of a big school umbrella. School and support organizations. That's, 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 that's what we call them in the facilities. It's 1030. It is. Yeah. That. Yeah. That's impressive. Uh, <laughs> and um, additional school support organizations. Yeah. There you go. If we're, if we're going to do more work on it, I'll, I'll be picky about, like, we're missing a period. Oh, my God. In the big column next to teacher signature and... We should be more standard about um, capitalization, like superintendent is capitally capitalized here, but not here. And your notes, Jean. So I can I can give you all. I circled all my things. Um, and Susan's title is director of finance and operations, not business manager. Oh, Just so if we're gonna if we're gonna keep working on it, I would say but, let's. But let's all we do have all, all we have to do is approve the changes to the policy that references that document. That is what true. What happens to the document after that fact? That's it's kind right. of scary though. What yeah. Jean so does at ten thirty at night? Uh, like, do you see how quickly she did that? Question I about the business time. manager thing. It says the building business manager. Is that, that, do we still have, it's, yeah. So building needs to come out too yeah. then, because it's not specific. To <laughs> she is very also in charge of buildings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. All right, you're about. right. So, okay, too. so school right. support and additional school support organizations. So really, and you're right, John, all we're doing is voting on the changes to the policy, which really is only just to add that there is a funding approval form. And then you will polish that up however you do it, but it that doesn't have to come back. Okay. Right? Make so a little note that says polish on here. Is, um, so does that mean that you're ready to make a motion to that effect, John? I am, in fact. Okay, awesome. Go for it. So I would move to approve the changes to policy KCD to include procedural reference KCD1. Excellent. And a second? Second. 
Okay, so a motion by Mr. Graziano, a second by Ms. Devlin. All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed or abstained? So that's unanimous. And um, okay, so we are ready to move on to school committee policy EBC safety and security. And I'm going to pause here and just say, I know you're stuck with us. Are they stuck with us? Who? Susan and Carol. Oh, we're almost done, though. Okay. Yeah, we're well, getting, you're the last turbo. Yeah. No, okay, yes. Well, we, we have actually, superintendent you're right, search, you're right, too. You're right, you're right, you're right. So, it's five you. minutes, but... <laughs> I made the mistake of, said, of asking you or, re, or telling you that it was okay if you left, and then the minute you walked out, we needed you to for something. Um, but we are good to go now, yeah. and thank you so much for both of you for wonderful it's probably only five yeah, minutes but you. you'll beat us yeah. out of the parking lot at least yeah. right well we're parked almost we're all the so way out in Hayden <laughs> Row <laughs> yeah, so, so, it was should, so crowded we should have stayed in the, in the lot you <laughs> <laughs> we should have just stayed <laughs> just there walked across. Right. <laughs> thank, thank you so you much well, thank you so yes. much great job thank you um okay sorry to interrupt you no not at all um so school safety and security policy EBC is on for a third reading um mainly because we wanted to look at this language that when we brought it up at the last meeting around our practices as they relate to emergency responders and um, people that have access to uh, school facility, uh, diagrams of school facility interiors. In following up with Sue and with Tim and with the people that would actually be using this procedure, everything is now electronic and are on our phones under um, Crisis Go. So everything is shared electronically, and it, it did not feel, it, it is no longer necessary to have this policy, these steps within the policy in place, particularly the area that's, that we've crossed off. So if it reads diagrams of school facility interior, school safety and security procedures, which is what we added, and equipment contracts will not be made public. Covers it very nicely. I agree. Okay. So are we all ready? Mm -hmm. uh, so I just need a motion to approve policy EBC as amended. So moved. And a second? Second. So a motion by Ms. Cavanaugh, a second by Mr. Graziano. All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed or abstained? So that's unanimous. Um, the last item under old business is that we actually, although you voted to appoint the superintendent screening committee at our last meeting we actually um, there was a scheduling change that happened that meant that one of the people that we appointed was no longer available on the days that the screening committee was going to meet so uh, Nancy and Nina did some quick work to go back to the list and um, find an alternate so we are just approving a new list that re represents a new um, parent of an elementary student because of our scheduling issue. So I we're very apologetic to the gentleman who um, who had volunteered to do it. But um, is there another change with Denise though? No, nope, she, she was on it. She was already listed. She, she wasn't listed as a yep, parent. Initially. I don't think so. Yeah. So there's really unless anybody has a question about that, all we need to do is just vote to appoint this superintendent screening committee and as I said our first meeting is on Wednesday so I really hope that you guys <laughs> <laughs> unless you'd like to I schedule will, another school committee meeting yeah okay I second that um, so motion by Mr. Graziano a second by Ms. Barrett all in favor yes. 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 yes any opposed or abstained okay so that's unanimous we are now at our second opportunity for public comment we've lost every member of our public so I'm going to assume that we will get some time back here you count Bob you um, count. and so then we are on items by consensus does anybody want to pull any out for separate consideration okay dr. McLeod the superintendent recommends the school committee move to approve the items by consensus as outlined below okay so a motion so moved and a second second a motion by Ms. Barrett, a second by Ms. Devlin. All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed or abstained? So that's unanimous. And we are ready to adjourn at 1040 um, if someone is willing to make that motion. 
Uh, I'll make that motion. Okay, so in a second? Second. Okay, motion by Mr. Graziano, a second by Ms. Cavanaugh. All in favor? Yes. 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 Okay, so we are officially adjourned at 1040 p.m. Thank you so much to HCAM, who is always on the other side of his camera with us on late nights. So thank you. Our next meetings will be November 16th, November 30th. We added a special meeting on December 7th to interview superintendent finalist candidates. And then we'll continue on with our regular meeting schedule December 14th and January 4th. All right here, all at 7 p.m., all on TV. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Mm -hmm.